A night in with Mola and the drinker Getting trashed with the web screen pictures A cheap night cause I'm feeling kinda thrifty Got a ten pack of beers and a bottle of whiskey Hop up the cork, have a glass of wine hey. That's the old say Trouble walking in a straight line But all the appeal you are It's open bar With our host Mola and the critical drinker Oh yeah, here we are. We're back. Yeah. We're back, baby. <laughs> Especially after such a big event as well. But in the real world, so does it really count? I don't think it so. was a mega event, more where it wasn't just big, Whoa. It was mega. Uh, Calm yes, down. we were. I was off at MegaCon with Gary, with Eric July, with Geeks and Gamers, with about a million other people, and it was damn good fun. I enjoyed that whole weekend. It was a great experience. The atmosphere was amazing. The reception from everyone was awesome. Uh, there was just so much positivity and support. It was great fun. And I got to drink as much as I wanted as well um, oh. at any hour of the day. So what, what's not to like, you know? I'd say so. And there's going to be countless people in chat saying, like, it was fun to meet you. I don't yeah, <laughs> wait for all that. You know? <laughs> Hi we to met, you all. This is the thing. We met a lot of people when we were out there. Um, I lost track of the amount of, uh, like, things that I signed. So it was, so it was good. We managed to get through When are you going to set up DrinkerCon? I think so. Yeah, it's um, it's just a matter of time. We'll just have an entire convention center just devoted to me. <laughs> they, it'd be funny if, like, to match around the booth, there was a big conveyor belt and it was just shot glasses and there was assorted spirits. <laughs> and they get refilled <laughs> in the back, but you know, everyone could just shot it and put it back down as at their free will. I, I loved it. It's like we're in the middle of doing signings and stuff at the the rip of our booth, and um, one guy just came over with a can of beer and just put it down and says, "Here, you look like you need this." Um, <laughs> Was it, right, cold? Fine. was it cold? It was cold, yeah. It was hey, cold and unopened right. and good to go. So I cracked it open and away I went. And it, he was right. It was exactly what I needed. So thank you to that man. Um, Yo, but man. hey, we've got a bunch of our guests waiting here in the wings. So we should start bringing them in, I reckon. I shreckon too. I shreckon, yeah. Mm. All right. First up, uh, making his return to the bar after a couple of months away, it is Endymion. Welcome back, my friends. And I love your Final Fantasy VII background. Beautiful Favorite game, game of all time. Yes, of all time. And love yes, it. I know that makes us complete normies in the RPG genre, but I don't care. I love it. I don't wow. care either. I've played so many JRPGs and Seven's the one that like framed everything for me. So unapologetic. I don't care. I love it too much. Nice. Uh, you excited for the remake part two? Yep, I hundred percented the Final Fantasy VII remaster, hundred percented the remake and the PS5 version, and you already know I'm gonna hundred percent the rebirth. Big, big, big fan. Do you stream yourself playing it? I've been asked so many times to stream. I should do it. I'm just lazy, and I you guys do it so much better than I do. And I feel like if I play video games on stream, I'm the kind of guy that rubs the walls to find all the items and like make sure everything. I don't know if I'd be very fun to stream. I should try them. <laughs> you to be fair, if you've... That with uh, with chat, I found that because I love to search for everything, but chat get restless sometimes. And you're like, hey, hey, it's yeah, that's fun. Me. We'll find stuff. I promise. Yeah. Yeah, it, it depends me. on the game, like because there's certain games where I just genuinely want to like and take my time and enjoy it and appreciate the yeah. story, and like where you feel like you have to be constantly entertaining people if you're streaming it because obviously you've got like a few thousand. Thank God no you. one watched me play Final Fantasy 16. I'll just say that I was yeah. rubbing every wall looking well, for everything. The, so the worst is playing fucking famously beloved games really late because you'll be like. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I might end the stream there and everyone starts shouting, no, 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 the best yeah. part's coming, yeah. Just around the corner, yeah. like, what are you doing? You're like, oh. <laughs> it's like, it, sometimes they, they kind of, uh, yeah, they spoil it for you a little bit as well. Like when I was playing God of War Ragnarok and it's like right at the beginning, you know, when the, the dog or the, the big um, dire wolf thing dies. Um, yeah, they, they, they were like, oh, sad, sad doggo moment coming up. Dude, ah. I have I, I have one spoiler that I'll never forgive. It was for IGN, and they randomly in an article spoiled the big twist in uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic for me before I finished it. I don't want to say the spoiler in case I'm going to say I don't even yet. know what it is. <laughs> I don't want to say it then. It's amazing. But like they spoiled it for me, and I'll never forgive them. Ooh. So, yeah. Oh, Nor should you. To, to this is day. It? It's funny, it's like, see, uh, in chat, I keep seeing this, and I don't know where it came from. I heard the x-ray girl drank you under the table. <laughs> really? Yeah, Gary said this. 
she, she tried it in London and it didn't work out too well for her. I, I don't really remember her trying it in uh, Wait, in Florida, is this but... actual slander that's happened? I My believe God. it is, yeah. It is slanderous. I mean, she's a girl, man. She can't drink for shit. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Guy. Holy shit. There, I said it and it's true. You know it is. Um, to be fair, I, I'm, I'm a little bit hazy on what happened on the Saturday night. Um, yeah. I'd be lying if I said I entirely remember getting back to my hotel, but I did walk out of the place. And if you walk out of a venue, you know, you're doing okay, I think, if you're under your yeah, own yeah, power. Definitely. So, yeah, it's all good. But anyway, we should bring our rest of our guests in. Enough drinking stories for now. Just for now. There'll be more later. Uh, next up, making her return to the bar, it is Baggage Claim. It's always awesome to have you back. Welcome aboard again. Hi, friends. How are you guys doing? Hello. Doing good. Super this evening. We're fired up for a lovely stream tonight. I definitely cannot un drink anyone under the table, to be honest. So I <laughs> I would not represent my gender well in that competition, that's for What's sure. What's your drink of choice? Beer, a Hefenweizen. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of shots getting bought. I recall that from the Saturday night. When people want, everyone wants to do a shot with you and you think, well, it's rude to refuse them. But they, <laughs> they do start to add up after a while. <laughs> Can I have a shot of water, pump? please? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, just start sneaking in water shots instead. Yeah, uh, I'll have a shot of Red Bull, please. <laughs> like, it's vodka, trust me, I swear. <laughs> Red Bull yeah. and vodka is so vodka. good together. So good. Yeah. Not healthy, but great. Not yeah, healthy. it keeps you going. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us for this one. I'm going to bring in our next guest. He is, oh my God. I'm not sure if we're going to get Frank or Chris this evening, but either way, he is gory. It's Chris Gore. Hey, thanks. Woo. thanks, drinker. Uh, I'll just say, I think I trained X ray girl well, but uh, yeah, <laughs> no, there's no competition for you. No competition <laughs> at all. Why were you not <laughs> in Florida? That's what I want to know. We could have done know, a lot of drinking together, Chris. Yes, that's true. I, I, I don't know. I just, I have, uh, I, I'm juggling a lot of things right now to be, to be fair. I will be in Vegas. I will hundred percent be in Vegas, which is going to be a lot of fun already making plans there. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. But I, I followed all your event adventures and uh, yeah, I felt a little FOMO for sure. For sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's good fun, but looking, to, looking forward to the next con where we can meet up again. It's going to be, can great. I just say real oh, quick, yeah. Mm. I've been watching Chris Gore since Attack of the Show when I was a kid, so this is like big fan. That's all I want to say. Well, well thank you, son. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I get that a lot. It's weird. So, yeah, yeah, no, I cool, man. Back of, Great. I remember yeah. the back of the day. Yeah, watch it all the time. Good to be with there you is that time. magical threshold that you cross, right, where uh, you start to feel really old. And I had this at the con a couple of times where people came up to the booth and said, "I grew up watching you." <laughs> Like, what? <laughs> How long have I been doing this? <laughs> Jeez, yeah, I've years. been watching. I've been watching Drinker and Chris since I was in uh, grade nine. I'm 31 now. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry that to make you feel great. old, but like that's how long it's been. Jeez. Dude, yeah. When people are like, oh, I still watch EFAP in high school. I finished college. I'm back. You're like, no, stop, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> it's been that long. This amount of time cannot pass. Wait, Jeez. how long have you guys been doing this? I feel like I'm. Totally don't have a good perception of well, time. Well, me and Open Bar's been going for how long now? Drinking a year and two, year and a third. Oh, is this shit? <laughs> All yeah, of our right. Right. Like a year and well right over right. ten years now. I think right? yeah, so, fifty yeah. years. Well, this yeah. is yeah, this is our eighty third anniversary, so eighty three years. <laughs> yeah. Did you you did call it Open Bar number one? Oh shit, was it two years ago? Damn, September the third on twenty twenty one. What the fuck? Whoa. Well, to be fair, <laughs> initially we were only doing it every couple of weeks, so it wasn't until later that we did it weekly. So yeah, but that still counts as where it started, right? Yeah, oh, episodes so, yeah. with Gary and Az. Oh, yeah. Oh, and oh, a whole bunch of people. Damn, it's been but, like yeah. three wonderful years, though. But the thing is, drink it in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, we started open bar way late into our relationship. <laughs> like, but then again, that was fucking ages ago. It's like, damn. <laughs> this is yeah, it. Time passes quick, you know. Efab's yeah. nearly six years, I think. We're on a six-year anniversary this year, so um, yes. it's funny. I'm sitting here, it's like Chris goes, it's like, yeah, six years. Wow, long time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Not no, really. Like, yeah, I was doing Attack of the Show like 15 years ago. <laughs> And I That's where I it, watched them, man. I think it's you'd been... recommend all the all the, all the DVDs and everything. I'd be watching downstairs in my basement. Oh, that's cool. I yeah, hope man. I corrupted you well. 
<laughs> no, yeah, you did. You did. Don't worry. No, you good, did. I watched you guys good. X-Play, all those shows, everything. Well, I'll make you all feel old. I started Film Threat as a fanzine, which was Xeroxed. Out of high school, it was 1985. Oh, wow. I wasn't Ooh. born yet. <laughs> That's how long ago. I wasn't yeah. born yet. Neither was Drinker. <laughs> I wasn't I was only at that point. <laughs> I don't think many of you were born. Uh, That's yeah, so, so cool, though. Yeah, so it's been it's been through some media changes mm. a lot, uh, but I've only really been doing YouTube seriously for like two three years. Like we started our YouTube channel in 2017, but we've only been doing live streams a couple years with Alan. And I'm sorry I was late, but uh, there's some interesting Disney related breaking news Ooh. that we just uh, that uh, I'll share when we get to the conversation part. Here, okay, it's cool. crazy. Um, let me uh, let me bring Disparu in, and then we can get rolling with this. Uh, cool. Hey everyone, it's this brew. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So, so many things hello, I want to comment on. Like uh, film threat is older than me, confirmed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So it beats me. Film I, I joined older than the internet. Yeah, I, I, I joined when Critical Drinker said that's that's enough of the alcohol related stories. I'm like, isn't that all of your stories? Somehow, yeah. Even my driving like, test. And if everyone is buying you shots, I remember the size of your line in London. I would not want even like a tenth of those people buying me shots. I would not survive to the end of the night. It's so. starting to get messy and hazy towards the end of the night, but I'm reliably told it was good fun. Um, the thing is, I, sh <laughs> I showed up like an, an hour late maybe to start because we're caught in traffic and stuff. And um, Ryan Kittle came up to me and he's like, dude, I'm already six drinks deep. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> he was he was apparently convinced he was going to drive home at the end of the night, and they had to work <laughs> really hard to, to stop him. <laughs> no, yeah. Good luck with that, uh, Ryan. It it is kind of the British way. You you judge the night before based on how damaged you are the morning after. It's like, oh, you yeah, should have yeah. it was a great night. I I can't feel the right side of my face. <laughs> it's like the, <laughs> the, the more paralyzed you are the next morning, the better night it was. The the <laughs> other problem I think I had was like I didn't have time to have lunch, so I had an empty stomach. When oh, I went oh that's yeah, not that good. That's not, not a good way to do things. That's I don't think. Good. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Let's let's carry on with this stream. So apparently, there's breaking news. Chris, take us away. Um, so you know about the story, the D files that Alan Ng has been doing on uh, filmthreat.com. Love yes. those, by the way, Chris. They are yeah. excellent. So yeah. Everyone check out Film Threat. The, the D files mm -hmm. are some very insightful stuff. It's so, at Disney. Yeah, so the third uh edition of the D files drops uh next Wednesday, but this just happened today. Alan was predicting after what happened with Wish that Disney would be shutting down animation in the United States. They opened up a studio in Vancouver with 400 people. So the future of Disney animation is overseas and AI. Whoa. And they opened up this new studio in Vancouver. Well, apparently they are the ones that will be doing the animation for Moana 2. There was a meeting at their Burbank studios that just happened over lunch that uh, Alan and I were just talking about before I got on here and um, they assured everyone that there won't be layoffs in Burbank. And can I just tell you when everyone got laid off at G4, they assured us that there would not be layoffs. <laughs> you never pro project that they're going to be huge layoffs, but it's like this studio in Burbank has nothing to do. Moana 2, which is the only Disney animated movie that is in production, is all going to be done now in Vancouver, Canada. Now, you can theorize as to why they might be moving everything out of the United States. Perhaps the debacle of all the uh, fallout from the DEI that has just infected, permeated everything in entertainment. That's a separate mm -hmm. series of stories, but it appears as if the Burbank studio will not be doing this movie what other movie are they going to be doing? They weren't They weren't told. Um, there are people currently working at Disney and former employees that keep us informed with what's going on. But uh, that's huge news because basically what it sounds like is they're winding down their operations in the United States. And is that a cost-saving exercise, potentially, like moving out of the United States and into Canada? Yes, partially cost savings, and but also um, the people in the, the people that you hire in Hollywood, there's a certain sort of uh, entitlement. There's a certain kind of attitude of uh, people that are working in the industry here. And I think they're looking to just excise that it's part of like, you know, you're constantly getting pushback from these um, 
up and coming people who aren't veteran animators. They haven't been around the industry or been on many productions. They don't really know how it works and they have proved to be difficult to manage, which, um, Alan is the one who predicted it. He should get all the credit. It's on the front page of filmthreat.com. If you go there right now, it's our top story, but it's, um, it basically, what it is, is they're just winding down operations in the United States. It's, um, you know, is the, do you think this is a, a first step towards trying to course correct? It, like it a recognition, might, like we're going got, to Canada. Problem. Yeah, I was gonna. Canada. That's what I was gonna say. Moving. If I was gonna say, if they're moving it to like Korea, that's different. But they're moving it to Canada. Canada is probably you know more woke in terms of oh, yeah. you know entertainment and whatnot. I mean, look yeah. at you know, how does someone like Trudeau? I live in Canada. Up? I know. Oh, yeah. Wow. No. It's it's awful. It's, it's so divided there. So I think, you know, almost worse than the United States, the mm. Canadians are so polite. They're nice about their nice about it, which is weird. It's always, <laughs> it's always, I've always never trusted someone that's too nice to me. I feel like you want something. <laughs> this is creepy. But yeah. So that, yeah. that just, it's, it's sort of like a stay away from my kidneys. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, you can nice have my liver you. if you want. There's nothing <laughs> I'll trade but, uh, you livers, actually. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be, There's no, this was done without fanfare. We heard from someone that was a company meeting in Burbank. The entire Burbank Disney Animation Studios got together for this meeting over lunch. Alan has all the information in the story. But the only reason we even knew this was coming was because of a Instagram post from the guy who is heading up Moana 2. Not that that's any big deal, but Disney has so little on their plate right now. I think you saw in the earnings call that they're just going to be doing fewer things. I think when they said to Marvel, uh, regarding Marvel, they'll be making fewer movies, fewer TV shows. It's just yeah. less. Well, that's the, I mean, you wouldn't think Canada was even that much cheaper than America. Well, like you don't change oh, the attitude is. or like the people involved. So... Even moving it at all seems a bit weird. I, it I would think be tax, tax breaks are a big thing when it comes yeah, to Yeah, and the yeah, dollar is obviously I'm, weaker too, so it would cost yeah. less. California and is not enticing any business at the moment, clearly. No, no. it's so expensive to live here. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I live in a little oasis called Pasadena, California. Mm. But it's but it's um but everywhere else in California, especially LA, San Francisco, it's a hellhole. It is a fentanyl zombie land, which would be a great video game is, is san francisco the place where you leave your, well. <laughs> was that san francisco where you leave your uh, everyone tells you to leave your car open because they're going to break into it anyway yeah yeah, yeah that's just that's just seth that rogan dystopia yeah that's <laughs> some sure. living someone in a someone, someone left that. a butterfly knife on my back seat it was like a prize <laughs> you know yeah, but yeah this... it, it's easy to say when you're a fucking multi-millionaire <laughs> yeah exactly right? yeah exactly which car? Yeah, someone broke into? into my car, and I can't afford to get the windows repaired. So yeah, guess who's getting free air conditioning now? <laughs> Every time he drives around. <laughs> it is interesting though. When you do animation, you could do it from literally anywhere in the world because mm. you could do the voiceover from. You can just pick your people. You know, they can they can do it from their home if they really wanted. Or so or AI. Can... Mm. Well, well yeah. yeah. So it is weird to go to sort of a developed, high paid. Yeah, yeah. The Canadian dollar maybe worth less but if you just the average wage you would think it would average out overall it'd just be a bigger number well, um so well, to do that compared to like a cheaper nation to get the animation done and then do the voiceover yeah. somewhere else that's what you'd do if you wanted i can't imagine tax breaks would make up for that mm. well, I, well I, I, the, the whole production yeah. cycle is going to be cheaper it's like you know right filming or me you know, i guess like living in somewhere like london versus living in like inverness like clearly one place is yeah, but you, more expensive than the other because let's just, everything you move it to like romania or something and well, yeah, everything of, is cheaper part of this I, I believe and i'm only speculating that this is punishment for wish doing so poorly um the the merchandise there's merchant target stores whatever all over None of it is selling off the shelves. Everything is orange sticker discounted. And, and I feel like this is punishment to the Burbank studio for delivering a terrible movie that performed awful at the box office. So they're rewarding and building up a studio outside of the United States. And from what I hear, they, they mostly want to work with freelancers anyways, because freelancers mm -hmm. do as they do as they're told. Whereas right. like the workers at the Burbank studio, they're pushing back. Why can't we have representation? Mm. Why are we? And like the whole thing in the latest, um, I don't know if it was in the D, the D files or the other story that I did on the WGA, but that you're only like, you can only animate a thing if you are of the identity of the thing you're animating. So for example, wow. if so young dumb. 
black female, then you are animating the black female character. If you are a white man, then you can animate a white. It, it is so stupid. The identity politics is so infected animation that it has destroyed the craft at, at, at its heart. Animators are actors. They, mm. th this is why, this is why when you see um, a lot animators, they all have mirrors, mirrors, yeah, mirrors mm. where they're, doing the performance and the acting. And then that goes into the animation, whether you're animating a human or a knight or a princess or an ant or a bear, like whatever, like it's, it's gotten so infected with, I just think are bad ideas that no one pushes back by, but in an upcoming defile story, we found the guy that's been doing the DEI training at Disney. You wouldn't believe what this person charges. We have the website. Oh, so we're exposing more of this stuff, oh. but but no one, not one person, not to mention the Jedi training. I don't know if you, you guys have heard of that yet. It was in the WGA follow-up story I did. Um, that's everywhere in Hollywood now. I, and it's old. It's been happening since at least 2022, if not sooner. So mm -hmm. Jedi training is justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Oh and, yeah, so this is oh, right. I yeah. feel like actual oh, Jedi so training dumb. would be probably <laughs> useful. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were more interested in that. Yeah, so um that came out in we had this um member of the WGA that wrote an open letter to the WGA. That resulted in a flood of emails, not just from WGA members, but also from people from other crafts like the art directors guild. Um, IATSE, people from IATSE, like I, I'm already working on a part two to that, a follow-up because I just, every day is like a new leak of info, but I don't know if we're going to see a pushback because none of these people are willing to speak on the record. And there are no trade publications willing to write the story mm -hmm. because they're just as compromised when right. it comes to the types of people writing the story. So I just prefer honesty about all this stuff. You cannot, you can't look at what's happened in the industry. You've seen in, you've seen your industry go from seven billion dollar movies in 2019 to was it one last year? It Oppenheimer, mm. if it passes a billion, I guess. If you count that as 2023, Barbie was the biggest box office film of last year. Right. So it's well, um, I, I, int very interesting. What's what's well, trying yeah. to I mean, it, it fits neatly into the the leaks that Elon Musk shared regarding the inclusion yes. standards uh, guidelines that were set out, um, and it's very interesting because it covers everything from on screen representation to creative leadership, below the line staff, and yeah. uh, industry access, even so the people that mm. you even hire into your organization. And I just thought this was kind of an interesting one to look at. So if we talk about on screen representation, I can just give you a quick rundown of what's in this this uh, guidelines um, booklet. Yeah. Uh, for, characters. For, be, before you do that, I think the most interesting part of that is what it says at the bottom, where it says that if you are in a hiring position, you cannot ask anybody about any of these particular groups um, because that would be illegal. So what you have is you have the WGA, <laughs> which Chris Gore and like showed the sheet for, the hiring practices, where yeah. everybody ticks their boxes to make a database of what everyone is. Yes. And then it allows Disney to search that database for who they want, but also avoid the legal requirement of you can't ask Asking anybody them. about it. Yes. So they can still dodge the law, but do what the law was intended to stop, which is mm. discriminate people against hiring. And so, this is straight this is straight up discrimination if you yeah. read it here. Yes. Uh, characters on screen representation. Fifty percent or more of regular and recurring written characters must come from underrepresented groups. Uh, actors, 50% or more of regular and recurring actors must come from underrepresented groups, which is completely out of line with the demographic uh, makeup of America or any mm. other country for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary characters, meaningful inclusion of underrepresented groups as secondary or, uh, or more mirror on-screen individuals, uh, including background actors. Series premise, meaningful integration of underrepresented groups in overall themes and narratives. Episodic storytelling, ongoing meaningful integration of underrepresented groups in episodic themes and narratives. So regardless of what your story is actually about, you have to meaningfully integrate underrepresented groups into your story, even if it's got nothing to do with them. And when they say meaningful integration, I know exactly what it means. It means positive depictions of them because they can't possibly de be depicted in a negative manner. And it, it literally wipes out an entire range of, like, not only historical stories, but entire genres. Like, you could not tell a story about the Romans under those ideas. 
because it'd just be no. Italians. Well, you can't tell this true, don't you Italians. know that the, the, the Roman Empire was 50% black and lesbian? Uh, according to the BBC, <laughs> yeah, from what I've seen of their historical dramas. Uh, but this is the thing. You, you either destroy history and entirely change what happened before, or you can't tell the story. And it handcuffs people to basically modern day stuff. Which or you do what possible. the BBC does and you pretend that history was completely different from what it actually was and just hope that everyone buys right. into your lies. Mm. Sounds right. like Cleopatra on Netflix, yep. Yeah. yeah. Sounds uh, like that Doctor Who special. Well, I mean, if you look at oh, the yeah, Oscars... with Isaac Newton. <laughs> the Oscars are coming up in a couple weeks. It's March 10th. Uh, mm. We're going to be doing a watch party. I hope you check. You can suffer through the Oscars watching it with us. But, um, you know, these standards that they put about diversity in the industry almost there are so many past oscar winners that would never be qualified a movie like dunkirk a recent oscar nominated movie would not even qualify under these rules to be nominated for best picture the new rules yeah. that they have instituted it's ridiculous you can't if you start to police art this is that that to me is it i mean not to mention the airline industry i don't know if you've seen what's what's mm -hmm. come out recently within the last day about the airline industry and 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 trying to apply DEI to, to yeah. um it's too white pilot. it's too white it's it's this is because I don't know about you if I'm flying it, I'm hurtling through the sky at hundreds of miles per hour at uh, forty thousand feet I definitely want a person who was chosen by the color of their skin or their sexuality to fly <laughs> me instead of like someone who's actually good at their job. It this is, is the um, same with firefighters too. They were complaining that firefighters are too white in America. It's it's like no one is stopping people from applying if if a certain group that's, happens that's to thing. apply. No yeah. one ever I, complains when like certain jobs are only women based, like nursing, for example, or right, teachers. It's right. only ever a problem when women aren't dominant in another thing. It's right. so ridiculous. Or I even knew same with garbage men. People never complain. And it, yes, you can say garbage men because ninety nine percent of garbage carriers are men and nobody ever complains there because it's such an unpalatable job that they're happy that there's no proper representation of of women in that job the, the garbage you mean you mean in sewers. You, well you got to be careful you mean garbage person i think that, <laughs> yeah well it's, well, it's like it, it's only a, it's, it's only an important thing when it's the big sexy corporate jobs that pay like That's a right. lot of money and require you to do nothing more strenuous than sit behind a desk and complain <laughs> about things like that's that's where they want them to to be included and um, i just I wanted to I just Sorry. wanted to make a quick point. Sorry uh, about some uh, the move to Canada. It just it just kind of occurred to me. I think one of the reasons why you know why would would Disney choose that versus let's say uh, you know a country like Romania or anything in the in Korea or oh, Korea. I think anything else would have seemed like they're taking a step back from their woke ideology because with Canada you can't really make that argument since they are actually far woker than we are uh, than America is, and I think that's sort of their way to punish Burbank, like you said, Chris, but yeah. also um, get to tax benefits and still claim that they're, you know, they're, they have no, no uh, plans to change any ideology that they've in, in you the know, thing inflicted is with Canada, on them. Like if they, if they had like hired it, like a studio in Korea, it's like, well, you've got all the representation of ethnic minorities that you could ever ask for. That's like right. amazing for them. You but know? Koreans they, they, don't they fall don't, in line with, with true, ideology. Yeah. So they don't also don't include those in the groups. Um, very often, the entire category of like sort of that Asian category is ex uh, ignored. Uh, there's even been like all the acronyms and stuff. At one point, one was created specifically to exclude people like Korea and Japan from it because hmm. th they do too well. It, it like there's a whole. The, the, it, this is one of the things it, it's like uh quicksand when you start digging into it the more you go in the more deeper it gets because it turns out what people say they want isn't actually what they want and they were willing to say whatever they whatever is required to get the desired outcome and it's more about the desired outcome than the words or whatever they purport to support which is well, why speaking, yeah. go, going to something like canada is that because if they went to Korea, it would actively act against them, despite the fact that it would make them more money. Hey, yeah. well, Canada, because, speaking of the oh, desired outcomes as well, I was going to like refer to the second section of this just inclusion standards booklet, because when we wonder about why so many TV shows and so on are absolute garbage now, especially in companies like Disney, uh, I think we got some of our answers here. 
50% or more of the producer and above on writing staff and 50% or more of the co-producer and below on the writing staff must come from underrepresented groups. Uh, I wonder... <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why so, so many uh, Disney Plus shows are absolute dog shit now. Mm. Uh, it all makes sense now. Yeah. 50% <laughs> or more of episodic directors must come from underrepresented groups. Casting director is from an underrepresented group or has not previously worked on a DGE show in this role. That's so my they favorite must, one. They must, the casting director must come from underrepresented group. You can't, well, so essentially a white guy can't be in that role. Hmm. Well, I don't, those standards, I don't by those standards. Oh, sorry, I, I was gonna just say by those standards, you are going to be forced to hire someone who fulfills a checkbox that that is not necessarily qualified but fulfills the hmm. checkbox. And I no do want to baggage, baggage claim. I have to give you credit. You just said something just out of the blue that I think should be popularized. You said the far woke. I hmm. feel like the far <laughs> woke could be like a new that could be a new term. The far woke. Right, I would say so. Yeah, Why you not? heard it here first. You know, the bar, and it's baggage the claim who gets the, the, the credit for it. Far amazing. Yeah. I didn't even world. remember that I said that. I, oh, I'll, I'll take your word for it, Chris. Yeah, anyways. But uh, I, <laughs> I like that they added into their very foundations of how you hire people. Um, you either have to be underrepresented or have no experience doing the job at all. So you either have to be underrepresented or be complete crap because you've never done it. So you'll by definition be awful at it. Like, hmm. Th there it's is so no, insane. yeah. At no point does anyone care about the quality or the entertainment. It's either you're going to be hired not for your talent, or you're going to be hired specifically because you have no talent in the role. Well, here's here's an interesting one as well. Promotion of a member of an underrepresented group into a role that constitutes career progression for at least one member of the writing staff. So oh. it's essentially fucking promote someone anyone from an underrepresented group i don't care if they can do their job or not just promote them give them an extra job that, the that's failing it. upwards makes a lot more sense now doesn't it it really does yeah, yeah it, it does. starts to make a lot more sense and then substantial year over year increases in members of underrepresented groups as directors uh and in the writing staff see this kind of stuff is just it's not just ruining films man it's in video games too i know you people mm -hmm. might know things things about stuff called sweet baby ink that's what yes. this is I That's saw your video. I was is. listening to your video about it today, yeah. and it was really good. Um, Thank you. Very insightful video on how they are slowly fucking destroying the video game industry. Essentially, Everything. any any game that's had Sweet Baby Ink consulting on the the script writing for it, you can write it off essentially because it's going to be garbage. Oh yeah, what about Ragnarok, yeah. Drinker? Did they actually have a meaningful contribution to that though? In the they, they made Anger Boda black. They said that's what they did. They gave con uh, consultation, so it's up to you whether or not they were listened to. I guess. I, I, I assume they weren't in that case. Well, it would be weird if they were, considering how Kratos is not ruined. He's he's strong, and he beats the fuck out of people, and he's a really good dad. It would be weird if they had, you know, wanted. That. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if their one piece of feedback was like, "We should have a, a black character in it," and either that they turn Angerboda black. I black. And mean, I'm not. I, I don't. And I don't mind that character because like, she's fine. But like, if that, I think if they like, totally introduce a, a plot point, I think it probably would have been that. One thing you have to remember about all of this is it's incrementalism, and so just a small win at a time is enough. As long as we are constantly moving in the direction we want, that's enough for us. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people who's like, we either have all of it or nothing, and it's like, mm. no. The, the way it came over this over decades, this has been going on for a long time. Yes. It's simply, literally a small win at a time, and we always move in one direction. Yes, and simply yeah. stopping it isn't enough because no. the, eventually they're going to push forward again. That's the problem. Yes. You push back; they, they'll eventually ask for too much, and so you push back a little bit and stop them in their tracks, and yes. then eventually they know you're going to get bored or you won't you won't be paying attention. And this is why they push forward every. Again. Every mm -hmm. video I make, I always tell people, vote with your wallet. You have to. Yeah. It's but, the only way we're going to be able to stop these things, at least at some point. You it's the only way you can do it. And so so, vote with so your Sweet wallet. Baby Inc., they consulted on the Suicide Squad destroy the or kill the Justice League. Oh. Well, so this, is, this is kind of the problem. The worse the game <laughs> is, the more, the more sort of uh, effect you assume they had on it. But like, I want to, I, I warned this on Real BBC. I don't think we should make the mistake of making them too much the villain like the emperor mm -hmm. here when we've got plenty of darth vaders wandering around like i don't think that we should be like oh it's sweet baby because the second they go down which seems inevitable to me you shouldn't be like ah we got him it's like dude rock steady's done 
Like yes. it's, it's not just oh, about they're dead. Baby Inc. Yeah, like they're, they're, they're dead, completely yeah. fucked. You are responsible for your own actions, and so the company is responsible for the game they put out, and all the employees at that company are responsible for the game that they made. So I mean, you could just put into comparison. Think of it this way: like Spider Man One, made by Insomnia Games. No sweet baby ink attached to that. Spider Man One, I think a lot of people would agree, is objectively like one of the best Spider Man games depictions of the character ever. He's strong. He's resourceful. In my opinion, like that's the Spider Man I wanted in the MCU, but we got a little Iron Man instead. But whatever. <laughs> then you play Spider Man Two. Spider Man Two is where Sweet Baby comes in, and Peter goes from the most powerful, strong, like adept version of the character to what I could only call a bitch. Like there's no other word I can really use for it. You know what I mean? There's a scene in that game where Venom backhands Spider Man, and he flies into a fridge, and the fridge holds Spider Man down. This is Spider Man. This is the, the guy that can hold buildings and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, it'll be a fridge. It drives reference. me nuts. They'll think it's is that a Is that a reference? Like, with the fridging and stuff? Maybe. I, it, I, I'm sure it will be. Fridge. They'll think um, that's really witty. Well, yeah. yeah and it's... A bunch of people have said, like, no, ball, no, wrong. And it's like, you don't understand. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to explain. <laughs> like, there are games that are horrendous that fit with this pattern that Sweet Baby Inc. haven't even touched. Just remember that. The companies that surround this awful company and not let off the hook just as soon as they go. No, th this is a problem that permeates the whole modern gaming industry, at least in the West. Um, th this desire to rewrite history or to redress the balance uh, in so many ways. And you see it in so many different games. Like, you know, Last yeah. of Us 2 is probably a great example of it. Um, and you could push back against it, but ultimately these games still make bank. And that's the problem. With, the think, gaming I mean, industry yeah. will always be unique in that because gameplay yeah. has such a large impact that you can like a game for the gameplay and put up with the messaging compared to movies where the story is basically all you get. And so you may have... Yeah, and somewhere. also I, with, I, with video games, you got to realize mostly the, the profit's made immediately, right? You buy the game one time, you have the game with a TV show. If DEI gets introduced over time, the show can do incrementally worse and worse with ratings, right? But thankfully with The Last of Us, at least when people brought that up, that game sold 44% less than the original game. And I think that's for good reason. Absolutely. And actually, the, the remaster of the first Last of Us sold, I believe, 18 million copies. And Last of Us Part 2 has only sold 10 million copies. Which well, is still assume, great, by the way. But you know what I mean? Still yeah. less. It's really similar to me that like my only goal with streaming Suicide Squad was to tell everybody not to buy it. I was like, <laughs> see, show, let me show you what it is. Show me what because like I've obviously seen the clips that. and everything. Is, no, is, I is, think it's so. true, <laughs> is it true that it broke your brain molar in many ways? <laughs> I have almost could, the the super cut will be out in like a day if you want to see all the worst parts of it. But like, yeah, I went through the context <laughs> of every single thing they did, and the funny Just thing the is. It'd be like the story is so fucking offensive, and I'm like, don't forget how fucking offensive the mechanics are, how offensive the UI is, how offensive the entire construction, the games as a service part. A by the people... way, go ahead. Sorry, just, just interrupt. But by the way, I made a video about Suicide Squad, and I actually looked. And when you watch the Rocksteady videos where they're promoting the game, they always show like a developer here and there, and like what they did in the game. I took those people's names that they were promoting during uh, Suicide Squad's release. I threw them through their names against the uh, credits of Batman Arkham Knight, and not a single one of them showed yeah. up. So everyone that they were promoting, row. they didn't they didn't work on on the Batman Arkham games. And this is what's happening. There's too many of these companies that are introducing all of these woke activists, I guess you could say, and mm. they're the woke, corrupting the these spaces. The far woke, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. TM baggage yeah. claim. I was going to say as well, like the the, the one woke, yeah. area um, where people are not interested in this stuff seems to be the Far East because the the developers mm. for Stellar Blade were getting interviewed about this, and well, you know what the main character of that looks like, um, quite Attractive. quite appealing to the eye, yeah. And he straight up said um, he has a they used a, a Korean model for their their character model for this one, and she's again rather easy on the eye. Uh, and apparently the reason is we wanted the most attractive looking body for the user. And mm -hmm. I just thought there ain't no way that any Western developer would ever have the balls to say something like that. <laughs> we made our female yeah. protagonist attractive because men like looking at hot women. It would be so <laughs> refreshing to hear like a shocker. The director to say like... But here's the thing, right? If you want to sell things to both men and women, you put attractive people in it. Like, for example, this yes. is the reason why Reacher is doing so well. Reacher's doing so well because it has an attractive man in it, so the women want to watch it. But also, he's a he's a competent man, so then men want to watch it too. Hmm. So really, at the end of the day, if you want to get the best result, I guess in terms of ratings or whatever, you kind of just give both genders what they want, and you end up with the best result anyway. 
it's and they're the refusing same, to believe that. It's yeah, the same it's, with that Barbie monologue that America Ferrera gives at the end of that movie. Because one of the things I was I was diving into it. I don't know why my mind went back to it, even though it's six months old. But oof. I was looking at one of the lines where she says, "You know, you have to look pretty for men. You know, you have to like look beautiful for men." And I thought. What the hell is wrong with that? If you want a man's attention for him to be interested in you, wouldn't you want to look good? And and then if you don't look good and then you complain that he doesn't give you attention, that's bad too. And wouldn't you want the man to look good for you? That, you know, he should work out and he should be presentable. He should bathe, whatever, whatever requirements <laughs> women. <laughs> you you are are insane standards. Bare minimum. Wash. I know, I've gone a little too far. <laughs> No, no, but that is that. What you you said is the point. It is like it. I have to look good for somebody else. It's like, well, that's a, a standard that you are imposing on yourself, and so you are responsible for the standard that you've imposed on yourself. But that entire story was my. That entire monologue was my miserable life isn't my fault. It's somebody else's. It's like yeah. no, every single thing in this monologue is a choice that you made. You are responsible for your own actions. You are responsible for the consequences of your own life. And if you don't like where your life turned out, that is your fault. Um, and it was like, no, well, plus, that like, entire who, movie was just blame somebody else for your decisions, which is a horrible which, message. Which functioning adult yes. in modern, like in any society, really doesn't have any expectations on them. There's no such thing. Like, you're, you're expected to, one, at least adhere to some minimum standards of like being semi-productive, uh, being able to do something useful, um, not being a complete shambling wreck of a person. And yeah, like you say bathe do personal <laughs> grooming occasionally and like the, the step up from that is like you most people probably want to be perceived as attractive you know most of us fail miserably at it but we at least want that as a minimum standard because like people like that that's generally what uh, what motivates them you want to be seen as either interesting or attractive or whatever preferably a combination of all of those things mm -hmm. but you also um, got to realize say, right is that when you when you are attractive you give off the perception that you are also healthy. And that's a big yes. thing, right? Yes. That's what it's a lot of people don't seem to realize. Children. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. And, so. and so, yeah, like there's not anything necessarily wrong with that, but it's almost like this um, <clears throat> acknowledgement that not everyone adheres to those standards and it's just so unfair that some people can't make it. Uh, well, guess what? Life isn't always fair. Like that's mm -hmm. survival of the fittest right there. And yeah, some people perhaps aren't going to be as healthy or as fit or as good looking as other people. That's just life. You know, we right. all learn to deal with that. There's always going to be someone who's better looking than you or more intelligent than you, more accomplished than you. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you can either spend the rest of your life being mad about that or you just move on and play the cards that you're dealt. That's just the reality of being a human. Uh, and I don't know why that's something I... that has to be railed against. Chris Gore and I talked about this offline a couple of weeks ago where there's this perception of, you know, people who sort of ran really successful projects in Hollywood, let's say, and, you know, created great pieces of art, that there's this perception that there wasn't any talent involved in that, that it was just that they happened to be lucky. You know, any anyone who was in that high position was just lucky to be there. And that's why then you see that perception reflected in these policies saying, that you have to you have to promote X, Y, and Z number of people uh, into certain roles based on DEI requirements because they think that all it takes is to be in that position in order for them to have the opportunity to produce incredible work. They don't see that there's actually work that goes into doing that. That it it takes sweat, it takes dedication, it takes it takes effort. Everything they don't see it that way. It's just oh no, this person had the opportunity to do it and that person didn't. My, my favorite quote for that is from Thomas Edison. When someone said, how did you invent the light bulb? He said, um, I, I didn't fail 1,000 times to invent the light bulb. I just invented 1,000 ways not to make one. And it is literally <laughs> you put in the work in order to come up with a successful result. And now, if I want a good show, I don't even watch, I don't even consider Western entertainment at all. I go to Korea, I go to Japan, I, mm. I go to their live action stuff or their anime um, because they have something that we don't and it is literally, they treat people as you would act in real life. So the men act like men, the women act like women. And mm. that means that sometimes you put someone in a situation and they just get scared and run away. It, they, they look awful, but it, it is um, what would happen in real life and it makes it believable and it draws you into the story. And you just don't get that in Western entertainment at all. People act too. like characters. Not to undermine you in any way, shape, or form, but I thought he didn't invent the light bulb. I thought he stole the idea. 
no. Oh, Tesla. that's right. They're trying to re rewrite that history, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, well, I mean, I googled it, and he said it took him one thousand unsuccessful attempts because I wanted to know how I many. Think, I think what he was working on was the ability to mass produce it, because up until that point, it had to be like hand constructed, like the um, incandescent filament tube light bulb. But yeah, because it's funny I, if you I mean, Google who, who whether truly he stole it or not, he still tried one thousand times. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, ultimately, <laughs> he's the guy who made it, who made it possible for everyone to have light bulbs in their houses. Whether he invented the concept or whether he just perfected it for mass production, either way, yeah, in he fact, had to one find a way to make it two thousand seven hundred and seventy-four times, which mm. would be even more insane. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, think... I agree with what you're saying because uh, you know Mahler and I have been talking about what, how I'm watching Buffy right now, thanks to his recommendation. <laughs> And <laughs> devious laugh. Um, and he um, and um, Buffy has this supernatural power, obviously. And then there's this one episode I saw recently where she loses that supernatural power and she's not able to take down people. And they show her have that fear where in the middle of the night she's suddenly caught up. She's, you know, she has that habit of going out into the streets because she's the one who takes all these demons down. But in this one episode, she loses her power for whatever reason. And she suddenly at the whims of these demons and has no idea what to do. And I, I like that they showed that, that there's that true vulnerability of her sex that that's still a reality and that whatever power she has happens to be, you know, an outlier. She uh she has a moment where she says, I'm doing this, it doesn't work, I'm doing this, it doesn't work, I'm I'm and then Giles finishes this and it says hitting like a girl. Yeah. I, I always remember the scene where like her and Angel get together for the first time and because he's not allowed to experience true happiness, uh, otherwise it will mm. like invoke the curse that he's been been lumbered with. Um he turns instantly evil. And it, like it's the moment of like vulnerability for her because I think she essentially lost her virginity to him. Yeah. And he starts mocking her. And she just looks so like distraught by it. Mm. Um, she because like she's like she thinks she did something wrong or she thinks she wasn't like she didn't perform properly or something and she just wants a little bit of reassurance from it, and he just absolutely tears into her because he's now lost his goodness that's in him um and it's such a great scene because you get to see a super vulnerable version of buffy and yeah, it's so real yeah and it's so consistent with how women feel when you know that there is that vulnerability of you know first time partner whatever and and then to be rejected so intensely right you know the day after i mean that's it's i think it's such a great capture of what a lot of women experience yeah Except i think now that's it would be undercut by a joke or something it would it would right. be some kind of clap back against him that I, you know <laughs> Which, dude, if buffy was done yeah, today they would they would like do it and then they, they would just say, Well, that just happened or something stupid. Yeah, like that. Right. It, is, it is crazy that talking he's about the condom there. bowl. Yeah, yeah. Modern, modern writers would never allow a woman to be put into such a vulnerable emotional state as that. She would have to be the boss girl who like absolutely dominates him <laughs> and you know has a laugh at him getting yeah. emotionally attached to her. And it's just like it misses the essential component of this like, is probably why part. I think because the it only goes against Western... how people act. Yeah, mm -hmm. the only Western shows I feel like I, I could Ooh. enjoy lately has been has been Reacher and that The was... Terminal List. That's mm. it. Yeah, I that the was show the I line. watch is just just talking down to you constantly. Everything else I watch that's Western made. Yeah, it's I, you know Reacher season two wasn't great, but it's like a, again, at least you had a, a, a male hero who wasn't deconstructed. He didn't need to be mocked and belittled, and there was actually competent, intelligent female characters working with him who complemented his his skill set rather than try to undermine it and. Yeah, good stuff. This is how you write shows, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's like we forgot the, ter the, the terminal list is the same way. Chris Pratt's the main character, and I don't remember. I think her name's Constance. Constance Wu, I believe is her name. Yes, the main girl in that. She's mm. great too. And they don't step on each other's toes or anything. Like, that's all we want. It's so easy, but yeah. they just refuse to do it. Hmm. It's funny too. It makes me the... really worried about Daredevil Born Again. I'm really worried about that show. Everyone's yeah, worried about be. that. <laughs> every <laughs> every time I see something from that show, I'm just like, I'm just like going like this the whole time. I'm like, oh my god, no. <laughs> At this like... point, anything made by Marvel is like anything that has um Samuel L. Jackson in it. I just automatically assume it's gonna be garbage. It's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> um it's yeah. funny as well, the commentary about like how if, if Buffy made today would be filled with like you know, awfully toned <laughs> jokes and stuff where you could argue it's the DNA of Avengers, which is the DNA of where we're at today. That's in terms true. of everyone That's true. trying to yeah, copy it just, and paste. It's, it's a matter of like proportionality, isn't it? Like how much of that like humor do you want to like override your storyline and your characters? Like mm. I think they, they achieved the perfect balance with something like Buffy and the first Avengers movie. 
Well, yeah, you, you, there's other writers who have done a great job of it as well. I think Tarantino does it uh, quite well. You have um, even James Gunn at his best. He does a really great job of tonal juggling. But it is not the challenge that all writers should be trying to achieve, where they're like almost doing it by quota, right? Like, oh, we've got a yeah. dramatic scene. Make sure you throw at least a few jokes in there. We don't want people being too. Actually, upset. I actually have a question. Do you guys do you guys have high hopes for Superman Legacy or not? Mm. Nope. Yes. I'm 50-50. Yes, because, yes, because um, I, I knew James Gunn when he worked at Troma back in the late 90s. Mm. I met him at the St. Louis Film Festival. He, um, I, I, I think he knows how to play the Hollywood game to get what he wants. I think he doesn't suffer fools. I don't, I think like himself and Christopher Nolan are like, you know, um, because I know James get, would get pushback from Disney on notes and he is wise to ignore them at the time that he did the original guardians of the galaxy. They just let him do whatever he wants wanted at the time. And if you look at the way he is casted, um, looks pretty good. Looks pretty yeah. good. And, you know, to be fair, yes, he is hiring people he has worked with previously, <clears throat> including his brother. However, they're well cast. And I think, you know, just like any filmmaker, they like to work with the same people. You know, Scorsese hires De Niro a lot or and Leonardo DiCaprio. I have no problem with that. They're very talented. So there, there's a big old difference between like yep. Scorsese, uh, like Robert De Niro, Leonardo DiCaprio, and fucking Sean Gunn. <laughs> I wouldn't have referenced. I wouldn't have referenced Sean Gunn. I'd go with isn't her name Jennifer Holland. I'd be like these are proven legacy actors. Sean Gunn's done plenty of uh, you know motion capture that I think proves that you should be kept around as a sort of like useful element of a film. But for her, like no offense, but you're obviously here for that connection alone. At least a Michael Rooker. It's like we're all very fucking aware of Michael Rooker's talent. So him being friends mm. with James Gunn so, doesn't. It doesn't. It's like okay. I'll just say this: Welcome to Hollywood and every movie and TV show ever made. There are always people who are friends of friends or whatever. There was mm. this horrible episode of The Mandalorian. I think it was the first episode of season three, and I was like, "Who is this child actor? How hard <laughs> is it to find a good child actor? Didn't even have to do that much acting." It's the first episode of Mandalorian season three. Turns out it's like Jimmy Kimmel's yeah. kid. Ooh, and it's like, happen, right? okay, Jimmy Kimmel, ABC, Disney, okay. But, you know, look, filmmakers are sort of like tasked with that all the time. It's like, okay, is, do you have a part for a producer's son where they can just stand in the background? Fine. You can see like a James Gunn rolling his eyes. You have to be diplomatic in order to do something on that do largest you? scale fighting the battles that you want to fight to get the things that you really care about. And if there's a reporter in the background who answers a phone and has one line, one line, which will actually get you a lot of money. If you only have one line in a big movie, fine. You know, well, you're paid by the word, aren't you? Well, I mean, you know, it, there's a difference between a pay scale for speaking roles and non-speaking roles, but I think just knowing James looking at his output objectively and not to say that he hasn't had misses. I didn't totally love Guardians 2. I think Guardians 3 is better. I liked his version of The Suicide Squad. Um, he seems to be able to thread the needle of, I'm going to give the studio what they want, but I'm also going to do what I want. Within yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what I get from him too. I feel like last yeah. year when I watched Guardians 3, that was, I mean, you guys probably agree. When I watched Guardians 3, Guardians 3 in theaters, I felt like that felt like a real movie made by someone that knew what they were doing as opposed to something like quantum mania or something as opposed to everything I'm, marvel put out like, yeah yeah you know, i'm sitting there watching this yeah. like oh my god there's actual emotional beats and people i kind of care about and like there's a good villain here like what's going on this is weird but how and can you say too, that when there was no speech letting people know that they shouldn't be dicks i know i know yeah yeah but like it's the thing like, oh. when, when, when i look at superman legacy i mean i kind of see james is playing it safe but in a good way like you know usually when you see kind of movies getting cast these days they'll be like oh like for example fantastic four uh, apparently pedro pascal and reed mm -hmm. richards which i'm like good god please no but it's, it's real no. apparently yeah um, i can't believe he's an intelligent fantastic. character that's gonna be a yeah a yeah but, i mean it, may, <laughs> it makes sense why he's reed richards because they wanted to make sue the main character so they need a pathetic man to stand on the side while the girl boss is all the fighting so pedro's perfect for that but um with like james gunn you look at superman legacy and like every single character i mean we haven't seen any footage but you look at all the characters and everyone looks like they're perfectly cast. Like they look like they've all been torn out of the comics. No one looks like they're like race swapped or whatever, or gender swapped really. Right. Everyone just like, like Mr. Terrific. I forgot the actor, but you look at him and you're like, yeah, that's Mr. Terrific. 
That's Superman. That's yeah, Lois Lane. That's that's Jimmy Olsen. You know what I mean? It's great. Yeah. 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 yeah and that's such you. a low bar, though. I, I mean, yeah. just it is low. Like it's character. pathetic. Yeah. It's it, pathetic. It, it, I know, but like that's where we're what at. Chris said it's like these people are willing to work within the bounds that Hollywood set with them. It's like, okay, I'll find a place for them. It's like, just the idea that that's what you have to do is a problem in the first place and shouldn't exist. You, but that, get, that's just that's the reality of making movies at, at a scale no, of. That's the reality of Hollywood. That's, that's just the reality. That's a problem with Hollywood. But but that, that, but look, there are people who've proven they can do it. Look at Chris Nolan. Chris Nolan did right with Oppenheimer. So there, the, look, it can be done within reason. But the larger the larger the budget, the less control that the director is going to have. Reality of Hollywood, and there are filmmakers who've proven they're capable of doing that. I I, I have a lot of faith in, in in James. And the thing that convinced me was the casting of Jimmy Olsen. When I saw the guy who was cast as Jimmy Olsen, yeah. I'm like. Oh shit! That's like Jimmy Perfect. Olsen. Out of the, that's like Jimmy Olsen out of the comic books, right? So yeah, hail to the even, far world. <laughs> even like uh, even like Hawkgirl and stuff. They like every, everyone he's cast so far. I'm looking at them and I'm like, yeah, yeah. like he yeah. also got the what's her name Anya Anya Chalotra. I can't can't say her name properly. The Ye Jennifer from from, Jennifer, from the Witcher yeah. Netflix. Yeah. yeah, she's playing Cersei in James Gunn's uh, DCU, and I'm like, yeah. This guy so far, like he's he's making the right choices with casting. Hopefully, I really wonder who Batman's going to be. I remember reading about how Alan Richson wants to play Batman, and I'm like, I'm kind of open to that, but I don't know. I, I, I just think he, I really I hope think he can do it. it's landing. If he, if he slimmed down awesome. a little bit, like he's got a bit too much bulk to him right now as as Reacher, but I think he can like lose some of that. Yeah, I, think I mean, who else? It. Who else could play Batman though? Like, like realistically, in today's at this age, point, like... the, yeah, because like what you want is a, a character that embodies that masculinity of of Batman, but can also play the suave playboy of Bruce is, Wayne. Like, because so, so many of the suggestions are like, yeah, if it was ten years ago, maybe like a mm -hmm. lot of people who would be good for it. It's just that we're in that era. Also, just to throw a complete spicy mix into all of this, uh, I would go for bat to, to bat for Guardians two. Guardians one is where I was like, oh my god, James Gunn's great. I kind of hate Guardians Three. I thought it was absolutely awful, and uh, what, that's why you I'm like 50, Guardians 50. Two. Yeah, I like Guardians Two. There's plenty. I like of them. Guardians I can't Two too. Guardians really Two like is why it. I didn't watch Guardians Three. I'm like, Guardians, this is Guardians, Guardians, I'm not watching Guardians Two for me is my my least favorite person. It's got. I, I, didn't, problems, I didn't. I didn't but, think it was as. I didn't think it was as slick and it was as tight as Guardians One. But I obviously love the interactions between Kurt Russell and uh, and mm. Star Lord. Well, yeah, and and Star Lord and Yondu and Star and uh, uh, I really love the sequence with um, Mantis and Drax where he's yeah talking about like his family and stuff there's a lot of stuff in there i think is really good guardians 3 i feel like is undermined at almost every fucking corner by this obsession the only reason the... why i can't watch guardians 3 again is because it's just too sad and when the animals well yeah, that's a good thing though. i'm like ah oh. <laughs> as much then, as yeah, yeah, yeah as much yeah, as it yeah. sounds weird it's good that it's yeah. so emotionally affecting that it gets mm -hmm. you because i think it could have been easy to fuck that up and like you just yeah. laugh at it or just think this is ludicrous i'm like the sitting there watching it, really i'm watching it in the theater with my girlfriend i turned to her and i'm like this movie's sad. <laughs> like this yeah. is really bumming me. It out. was so out of step with everything that Marvel had made up until that point, or at mm. least in the past few years, where it's like, oh my god, there's actual real emotional investment in these characters, and they don't all make it, and death is permanent. Oh my god, this is mm. this is so weird. And um, a villain that's actually worked. evil and irredeemable, finally. Mm -hmm. But yes. wait, Smaller, that, what were you saying? That why why is Guardians 2 so undermined? No, that I would go to bat for it. That's all. The the three is the, the sure. hotter take. I'm pretty sure I'm like the only person outside of people on EFAP that hate it as much as I do. But the other thing I was going to say is that I'm actually with Chris, but in a different way. Like I, I have faith that James Gunn has the potential to make the movie, and the I guess the the nepotism side of it doesn't come into my head at all about whether or not the film will be good. I see that. I recognize that it's like a thing, and but the, as he's already mentioned, we it's only because we know. There's so many that we don't know about that it might affect our judgment at this point. I'm just going to wait and see because I found The Suicide Squad to be like an entire mixed bag of stuff I really like and the stuff I really don't. And then there are movies from him that I love and then there are movies from him that I don't like at all. So I'm just sitting there like, I'll just wait. And I see love what he does. Super. Super is a great yeah, movie. Super is so good. I love that movie so it's much. It's the Rain Wilson movie. But it's the, the one thing, though, that James has to address, and this is actually a problem with modern movies in general they tend to have a second third act. So there's like the third act. Yeah. And then there's the second third act, which was the, um, I think the most egregious example is the Batman where it's like, yeah, Oh, that's a, yeah. Kind of ending. And it's, it's like, Oh no, no, mm -hmm. we got another ending for you. I mean, 
Oh my God. I mean, the only one who could get away with it well was maybe James Cameron, but now there's like full additional third act. This is also something in development that has been something where my friends who are uh, working screenwriters will say that studios are asking, so what's the second third act? They actually ask that out loud. This is why movie runtimes have crept up beyond like two and a half mm -hmm. hours and whatnot with freaking Argyle being way longer than it had to be yes. oh my god is this you know? is this a desire to have like an extra layer of narrative complexity onto things where you think you've wrapped everything up and then you, right. the, the filmmaker come in and say ha -ha, there's no there's another twist you don't look, need it look yeah. i'm indian i'm used to really long movies but at least we had it right in india where we had an intermission and still do and they serve samosas and chai and you can have like a little walk around for at least 10 minutes but here, it's like, if you're going to do that, can we at least have a break in the middle? Well, it's interesting how it's changed, because with Lord of the Rings, the scouring of the Shire, he said it was because, well, you've already defeated Sauron. We didn't mm. want another ending to the movie. Yes. You've already defeated the big bad guy. And it, it shows the change over time that now people are like, no, we want a second ending. So uh, even if you went back to the original films, you would have an entirely different films because yeah, they wanted to add things to it. Richard I mean, King's already like four hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah, but that, I, I well, it, the reason the... wasn't that it was too long. The reason was we don't want two endings to the same movie. Right. Well, yeah, it already has a, about five endings as it stands. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't yeah. need more. Uh, Avengers yeah, I never liked the, the scouring of the Shire from the books either. So like, yeah, I'm, I was fine with that being omitted. Um, I'm just conscious, actually, you know what? We're like an hour into the stream, and I haven't, I haven't even tackled the first thing that I was going to talk oh, no. about. <laughs> so I'm going to throw. I'm going to do any like interesting conversations. Our bad. Yeah. Well, that's it. We, once we get rolling, we just don't stop. But I'm going to jump right into this now, as most of you are probably aware. Um, Gina Carano, an actress that was in The Mandalorian, she was fired from her job back in 2021 um, after posting some you know, fairly controversial social media um, content. Um, been fairly quiet since then, but now oh, she is a woman scorned and she's come back for revenge against Disney and she's launched a lawsuit against them for wrongful termination, um, backed financially by Elon Musk, which is kind of an interesting development, I suppose. Mm. And, you know, everyone and uh, every man and their dog has been talking about this one on YouTube already, but I think it's an interesting one to, to cover because it's such an important, uh, I guess, development in um, Disney's <laughs> current like self-destruction, I suppose, um, where she has probably got a case on this one, um, mm -hmm. not just from the fact that she was wrongfully terminated uh, on the basis that she holds beliefs or political opinions that the company doesn't agree with, which I don't think is grounds to terminate someone, but also the fact that they slandered her um, and publicly defamed her. Uh, mm. which is a pretty solid basis to launch a lawsuit against someone. And I think she might actually win this one, or at least they might settle out of court because, um, I don't know, man, I cannot see this going to discovery where they have to divulge <laughs> internal emails uh, relating to Gina Carano. Uh, that seems like it would be very embarrassing for the company, <laughs> and there's probably a whole lot of stuff that they said about her that they do not want the public to see. Oh, okay, especially I in the lead this. up to that abhorrent yeah, we all comment. Thought, yeah. On that, no, that in particular about about it not going to uh, discovery, but instead uh, being settled. I think they'll, that Disney will make so many attempts to do that, but that each time Elon will encourage Gina not to settle and say, "Take this to the take this to the end." Kind of like what happened with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case is that this is not about the money. This is about revealing the truth, that the truth needs to out immediately. And, and, I, and I think that will be so important in sort of changing the tide in how Disney is perceived. Well, I think well, if you get a financial settlement out of court, it doesn't clear your name necessarily. And I think this is the big problem that she's presumably had this cloud over her for the past three years where she yeah. was publicly insulted by Disney and called... Um, all kinds of, you know, insults about her, her, um, her, her character, um, her willingness to to attack marginalized groups, and so on. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you have to get a retraction on. You have to get a public apology uh, mm. in order to clear your name, and that, I guess, is would be the the thing that she's aiming for with this lawsuit. The money is not going to be as important as that. There's also question, what though. Twitter is after. Like Twitter wants. 
to create a world where nobody dares harm you or your career for what you say on Twitter because you are actively damaging their website. And so the entire reason behind the lawsuit is that if you punish someone for what they say on Twitter, then we will come after you. It is about sending the message that you should not yes. do this to people who send messages on our platform. Because yeah. I, I fully I fully agree with the idea that like a company can't be forced to employ people. Like if say they're not needed anymore, yeah. they're not pulling their weight, okay, like they need to be let go. But there's a difference between that and just firing someone arbitrarily because you don't agree with what they said. Hmm. In off hours no. when you're not employed by the company. Like if you're doing yes. it on work hours, then obviously you're representing the company. But if you're saying on your personal account in personal time, it's got nothing to do with them. Yeah. I mean, this didn't this kind of already happen to James Gunn? Then he came back when they fired him because of the other tweets that he had. I mean, it's even with Jane Gina Carano. I'm always wondering, like, can she? Like, I'm, obviously, I don't know much about legal stuff, so I'm just like, I'm just asking the question: Can she legally get the company to take her back? Like, is that that doesn't seem like that could? Would really you happen. want? I, to? I don't believe. That I know. Would want you want to go back? I, I, don't, I don't think so. With them again? No, yeah, I think she would. She would absolutely refuse to work for them ever again. I believe. I have because, yeah, like, yeah. But they would they would they would, they would they would they would hire her and then what write her off I, in the next scene it would be her like, I, I've, going I've back heard to I've, I've heard rumors and I'm not gonna divulge my source, but um I've heard rumors that before this went public, Disney knew that this lawsuit was coming and John Favreau contacted her and said that if we were to bring you back into the Mandalorian, would you let this one go? Hmm. And apparently the response was nope. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's about more than that. Like you say, it's about like sending a message. Well, um, also, yeah. it's like you have already been mistreated by this company. You know well, what they're like. You know what they wanted. They wanted you to go through a struggle session of 45 different people who just mm. insult you publicly, who could then record it and would likely leak it to everybody else to damage your reputation further because they're not interested in giving you a fair hearing. They're interested in punishing you. And you, why would anyone want to go back to that horrific work yeah. environment? Yeah. Particularly yeah. with the Mandalorian season three being an absolute shit show, anyway, like it's it's not really something you want to then be associated it's not with. No, exactly. I likened it to like getting a job opportunity on the Titanic, like two seconds before it hits the iceberg. Like yeah. it's not going to do much for your long term prospects. You know? It's more like jumping on the Titanic now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's already sinking. It's half underwater. It's like, I've got a really <laughs> unreliable submarine that I can get you down there with. Oh, and isn't it crazy how they're making a movie now for it with like the worst title ever, The Mandalorian and Grogu? Exactly. Which, that's, yeah. that's that's it's, their master plan. Yeah. They've already shit the bed with that show, and so nobody wants this. So fuck knows if that will even happen at this like, point. Like this is the but... thing, though. This is why, like, I don't understand why they're doing this because the last time they made a movie on a big franchise that needed like Disney Plus homework, it was the Marvels, and it did horribly. Yeah. So why are you doing it again with Star Wars? They should because just release the Mandalorian they're, they're and Grogu on. This, you know, this is Plus. what happens every time there's a big earnings call or a big financial report coming up. Uh, Lucasfilm will announce a whole bunch of fascinating Star Wars projects that never actually get made and never had any intention of getting made. And then, you know, it, it's enough to satiate the investors, the people who are worried about their output. Uh, and then after the earnings call or the financial report has passed, those things will just get quietly cancelled so that no one has to think about it. I did again. find it interesting, though, that Disney announced all these things like, uh, you know, like Moana 2 and whatever, and the whole $1.5 billion investment in Fortnite and all that. Oh, we'll get to that, like, don't worry. Yeah, they, <laughs> they they do, like, they, they announce all these things within, like, a day or two of Gina Carano doing her lawsuit thing. I thought that was very interesting. Well, it was, um, it was the same deal with um, them announcing John Favreau directing a Mandalorian and Grogu movie after the um, Ray movie and all the controversy about Charmino Bay Chinoy. Like, we've got to take headlines away from this. What will get some sort of interest? Hey, John Favreau's coming back and he's directing a movie and it's going to be about the Mandalorian, the only semi-popular character that we have left. You know, okay, great, but it's just a deflection, really. Like, we all know it's not really a serious project. Um, yeah. But the, the thing that interests me i guess is what elon musk's stake in this is and it you know i i don't want to apportion really petty motivations to like billionaires but it seems <laughs> sure like it, it. it literally is just a giant fuck you to bob Iker. i think yeah. it's literally just you cut disney advertising on twitter it's really hurt our bottom line so i'm gonna fucking destroy your bottom line at the same time and if it means there's 
launching a lawsuit against you? Sure, I'll do it. Because it honestly seems like he timed that to perfection right before the Disney earnings call when mm -hmm. Bob was going to be on the, the hotline and he was going to get questions about this. He just wanted to make him sweat and he wanted to do it any way that he could. And this seems like a pretty effective way of achieving that aim. But it's two birds, one stone, because he, he was in contact with a lot of people which have suffered from, like Kara. Uh, he was in contact with her when she got five comments mm. that she made on Twitter. So this was a long time coming, and it was a message that he wanted to send. And I think he's the kind of person where if it lines up, something else lines up with, so, um, like he's got a grudge or whatever it is, alongside an actual real-life problem that he can solve, then that's just better. And he will choose the best example. And I don't think there is a better example than what you have here. Because she can literally list off in court all the other things that Disney have done, which are either similar or worse than anything she could have possibly have said to their bottom line or their customers. She-Hulk literally had the fans in their show as the villains and the evil bad guys. And they right. were proud of it and bragged about it to everybody. And it's like, what, you, you're going to say that that was more damaging to your bottom line than somebody who made a, an offhand comment that had nothing to do with your customers at all, but you tried to insinuate it was? Yeah, and I, I think uh, I can understand why there's this feeling that this is petty because obviously, yes, Disney pulling, pulling advertising is a big deal for, for X. But I also see that Elon is a man who cannot be bought. First of all, he is incredibly rich. And... I don't I think all the sort of culture overlords that want to keep this like tight grip on how everybody should think like at Disney, like at these, you know, traditional media places, they're trying to understand why he can't be controlled. And even that that interview that he did two months ago with that New York Times person, where he, the guy's asking him, you know, don't you yeah. want to be trusted? Don't you want to be liked? You know, isn't it a bad thing that you're losing advertisers? And he says, no, why, why should money influence my opinions? And I think when he's seen this opportunity with Gina Carano um, and Disney, he wants to take the big, you know, elephant down that is that is manipulating a lot of people's thinking. It's influencing a lot of people into believing all this DEI nonsense. And he wants to take that out. There's an I, interesting I so. thing with uh, prison movies where it's like the first thing they do is they choose the biggest guy and they go and punch him in the face it's to prove that they can't be messed with. And in Gina's statement, she said Disney is the largest entertainment company in the world. It is, And so it is literally choosing the Goliath of everybody and going, if I can take you, I can take the rest of you. You probably yeah. shouldn't do this to the people I, I on think Twitter. You, as well, like Elon has made no secret of the fact that he's quite invested in the whole, like, the whole culture war thing. And he absolutely despises... Um, the SJWs, for lack of a better term, the woke mind virus, as he calls it. Mm. And, you know, he is fully committed to destroying that. That's partly why he bought over Twitter. Mm. You know, he saw it was utterly infested with that. It was negatively impacting the public discourse. And he decided he was going to step in and, and, um, and intervene there. And his solution was like, fine, I'm just going to throw a fuck ton of money at it and buy it out straight yeah. up because i'm the richest man on the planet and i can just I, do I, that through honestly sheer believe that financial muscle i honestly believe that elon musk buying twitter is a big reason why a lot of things are changing nowadays it's because we finally have a place where we can talk yes. about free speech well yes. my, so my point is yes, though like agreed. The, he his first step is like i'm going to um, buy up the biggest platform for public discourse on the planet yeah. like twitter like for for social media uh and Theoretically, I'm going to purge it of like these these biased elements to make it more free and open for people to just have honest discussions. The second step is I'm going to influence entertainment, or I'm going to like buy up one of the biggest entertainment companies um, on the planet that used to stand for, um, I guess, what was Disney? It was about family values. It was about Americana. It was about patriotism. It was about good old fashions. You know. Um, trad values yeah tra traditional yeah. values um, and it's now become something very very different and it's become a platform for people to just preach political crap at you i'm going to buy up that and i'm going to free it of this nonsense as well it's all aspects of cultural influence that he perceives as a problem that he's trying to tackle mm -hmm. I will it say, makes I think sense it's... in that context 
I think it's bigger than entertainment. I think it's more down to your job. Like, it is, if you fire people for what they say in a career, then I will go after you. Um, because that is one of the main reasons that there will be loads of people in Disney, in Hollywood, in entertainment who disagree with what's going on, but they don't want to speak up because it will cost them their jobs and they will yeah. lose their house, they'll lose their family, the, the careers, and the, the kids. They, they have people that need that job and so they won't speak up. And so it is about sending the message that you can um, say what you think and the company cannot come after you to punish you for your opinion. That's the message. So it, it goes a bit further than just entertainment. If that becomes like a standard then it goes across every single industry and every career and every company would be well, it's going to set a precedent really if he wins on this one like say this lawsuit wins that is going to be massive because it sets a precedent for other people within hollywood who want to express their opinions freely on social media without fear mm -hmm. of uh, without fear of being fired without fear of censorship um and that's an important thing and yeah, as uh, as Vush was saying here, wasn't he spotted with Nelson Peltz at a Disney function saying yes. something like, I'm looking for a company to buy. <laughs> Again, I think that's wins. just, Elon just absolutely shit stirring. Um, but he knew exactly what people were going to say. He knew what the inferences they were going to draw when he was seen there with Nelson Peltz. Uh, and he just decided to feed into it. And, and I he's say, e he was even dressed enough. the same as when he uh, said, go fuck yourself. Yeah, the same jacket on <laughs> and everything. Yeah, he's exactly, just the exact same too. He knew he's doing. He knows he's doing. If he were to buy like, Disney, he knows though, me and culture. Great. I think it would be the oh, funniest yeah. fucking thing if he if he did if he bought oh, Disney and just incredible. fired like eighty percent of the people there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine an MCU Star Wars that were like based and normal? It would make all the money in the world. He'd make his money back no problem. Yeah, I, I, the, he seems like such things. a mad lad. He would just come in and say, "Right, the sequel trilogy is decanonized. Fuck those films. I'm deleting them from from history." <laughs> you know, right. he seems like he would. It's one of the interesting things with the Disney board. They hold almost no stock between them, and because they're Bob Iger's ooh, friends, aren't they? Uh, just logically, that seems like a terrible idea that the people representing your company are not personally invested That's in the good. outcome of mm. that company, and. I, like I still think that the Bob is just holding on for every other year because if you're making thirty plus million a year, of course you're gonna try and hold on to that job as long as you can. You don't really care whether it's going up or not as long as you can just keep your claws in and hang on and get another thirty million. You will. Uh, I think I think Bob Iger's about legacy now. I think he like he's oof, obviously getting he's... older and he knows that retirement is not far away. But like he wants to leave on a high note. He wants to be able to he say did, like though. I left this company yeah he did the problem is he couldn't fucking let go and he felt yeah. like he had to come back yeah if he just left then and not come back like he probably would have been very like positively judged by history the problem is he couldn't just stay away his ego wouldn't allow it and so he had to come back and he had yeah, to get his claws in again when he first left that was when endgame came out rise of skywalker came out like it was the biggest year in movies ever and then he come, came back and everything's ruined now. And the thing that sucks is that we all know that when these decisions get made, they don't just, you know, go away after a year. Bob's going to be CEO apparently until 26, I think it was. So we're yeah. going to have his movies, decisions and whatever until at least like 28, 29, 2030. Like it's not over anytime soon, the longer he's there. There, there was one thing that stuck out for me about the public statement about this lawsuit, right? And it was an unusual thing for them to say but i feel like it gives it gives bob Iger an out it basically said uh, from gina carano's point of view i was fired uh during bob chapek's tenure as ceo of disney uh and all of this stuff happened under him and i just thought are they giving bob Iger a possible out here where they can throw um bob chapek <laughs> under the bus and say this happened because of him and um, we're sorry that he did that to you. I didn't do it. wasn't my fault. Uh, let's uh, let's repair our relationship because it, it feels like a very convenient turn of phrase for that something that they didn't have to say. Yeah, be because he, like Iger has already been throwing Chapek under the bus for basically everything. Even yeah. though yeah. the only problems he's facing now are li literally decisions that he made himself coming home to roost a few years later <laughs> because jpeg wasn't in the position long enough to really influence that many that much stuff but it would give him an out but the the thing the interesting thing is even if he used him as an out it would still hold disney to the new standard and so whatever it, as long as disney admits fault it would have twitter have the standard of you can't affect people for what they say on twitter 
because we've now made a judgment that well, that would be a you, wrong thing. Well, yeah, you could see this almost as a trap then, like where he might walk into it and say like, well, I can blame all of this on JPEG. I'll take the settlement and I'll issue a public apology, not knowing perhaps that, okay, what this actually means is I've set a precedent now for like this company going forward where we can't sanction our, uh, our employees for what they say on social media. So if they express views that we don't agree with, we can't fire them. Yeah, not even seeing that that was coming. It is censorship and fear that backs all of this up. The moment people start speaking out against it, um, w without like consequences or anything, it, it's, if they're not scared, everything would collapse because all of this is basically a house of cards built on foundations which are so fragile and obviously wrong that they literally have to be enforced by everybody. Like even Twitter being bought out was interesting because it stopped other platforms censoring stuff because it's like, well, you can just go to Twitter and read it anyway. So what is the point of us censoring it? So just one platform being available to have news shown did have an impact on other things as it was already. Uh, so I think yeah. any decision that this makes will help. I think the reason why a lot of people pulled their ads from Twitter is because of the fact that it has free speech. That's the main reason. Yes. That's what I believe. That's the only reason why they don't want to be on that platform and promote there is because they can't control it. That's the only reason. There's also, it's the same as the YouTube adpocalypse. One of the tactics that these companies have always used is if we make a big stink about something, not only do we benefit from pretending to be virtuous on this side, but when everyone leaves, all the ad prices drop. And so we can come in without saying anything, take advantage of low ad prices because everyone's left. And so later on, we actually reap rewards that we caused ourselves. Uh, so adpocalypses have always benefited the companies that also virtue signaled over leaving in the first place. I just want to say thank God I haven't been a part of an adpocalypse yet as my time on YouTube. I can only well, imagine. Well, you, you have. Te technically, you have, you just, yeah. You had the yeah. tail end. Yeah. Technically, you're a part of it. It happens every January, February Yeah, yeah. As well. No, like, definitely January. Oh, I noticed that for myself. Like, the that ads, month was uh, rough. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. No one's buying up ads there. I'd have a great um, video. I'm like, here we go. And it's like RPM. And it's like, it's like $2. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Yeah. Fuck my life. Um, I was going to talk as well about like uh, what we've had this week as well has been the Disney earnings call where Bob, Bob Iger has had to report on Disney's, um, I was going to say earnings. I don't think earnings is quite the right <laughs> word. Um, I love the titles though. The, the, the good news, the good news is that they have uh, reduced the amount of money that they're losing on Disney Plus. So yep. uh, hats off to them, everyone. Uh, they've now, uh, what have they lost now? Um, yeah. it's like two million subs, yeah, they, right? they've, yeah they've almost they've, two million they've only lost about 200 million dollars in the mm -hmm. past quarter as opposed to 350 million in the previous quarter so that's that's going down <laughs> that's good right that, that, that was my they've, favorite title i don't know whether it was ign or variety but one of them said this is an improvement over the 340 odds that they lost <laughs> in the previous three months yep. I'm like oh they, wow congratulations they've only lost 1.5 million users on disney plus this quarter so again that's, that's uh, a lot that's dude pretty good big yeah. progression yeah i think they they should really give themselves a pat on the back for that one well done disney. <laughs> well also the previous quarter they did a 199 three month special and so presumably a lot of those will have dropped off during this quarter true uh, depending on when well they have to. hiked their prices up yeah and that's uh, resulted in hence the the 1.5 million people that they've lost uh, sorry 1.3 1.3 i was miles off there so it's okay it, it's why it's uh, interesting they do the amount of subscribers and not the subscriber revenue which you would think would be the yeah. most obvious thing that you should do but it's easy to hide numbers when you do sales yeah uh it, it's great so you know bob Iger, i guess was feeling pretty positive about that and they've they've made a big investment in gaming as well so i want to <laughs> bob bob's discovered this new thing called uh video gammies i think <laughs> um yep. he said uh when i saw gen z and gen alpha and what the fuck's gen alpha it's the new one that's 2010 well, beyond right uh, uh, fuck something like that and it millennials the amount of time that they were spending in terms of total media screen time on video games, it was stunning, equal to what they spend on TV and movies. The conclusion I reached, we have to be there. Hence, they've uh, piled $1.5 billion into Epic Games. So, yeah, Honestly, Disney... from, from my experience, that's a really good investment on their part. 
probably one of the smartest things Disney's done in a long time. Because if you look at all of the, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I actually do play Fortnite, Fortnite with my friends. It's just fun to play and, you know, whatever. And if you want to talk about IPs and treating them properly, I don't think there's a better game out right now that consistently actually make gets the IP right in terms of how they look and how you can use it gameplay wise and everything. So them investing into Fortnite, honestly, is probably one of the best things Disney has probably ever done in a long time. Not like not not even kidding. Yeah, but the strange thing is the framing. It's like, oh, well, I saw people are actually gaming. I realized we had to be there. Yeah, he's like, he's uh, an old. We've been he... making Star Wars games and stuff for decades at this point. When I was a kid, we were making Star Wars games before you even owned it. And it, he makes it sound as if I, I just came across this newfound land. And it, yeah, would you would you believe it? It's called video games. All the kids <laughs> are doing it nowadays. It's yeah, like, like video the games people alone. That made video games are now adults. It's like what they are, they were your audience for a long time. Video games make more money than any other media thing combined, pretty much. Like, of course, they want to get into it, and they're they have it's like obviously you just in the discovered past... America, though. It's like you yeah, never I know. believe what I found, folks. <laughs> but like, obviously, they're they're making quite a bit of money, right? They had they had Spider Man Two. They're having Blade with Arcane Studios. They had the Star Wars Battlefront games, although they canceled Battlefront Three, which was moronic on their part, especially if you look up concept art for it. They were going in like a what if scenario on that one. That would have done gangbusters, but that's Disney for you. But yeah, but yeah them, the, the, them buying, them getting a stake in Fortnite though, that's a really good move on their part. I don't know if that'll, you know, ruin Fortnite in any way, but no. if you want any company that's going to like treat your IP correctly, you would probably want to go with Fortnite more than anybody else. Because like I said, they've been killing it with everything. Like just look at the Ninja Turtle skins. So like the, the, all the, nin, the Ninja Turtle fans online, I've been like losing their minds over how Fortnite's been designing like Shredder and, and all those characters. Like they look amazing. Peter Griffin. Yeah, but, like, yeah this like, while, like Doctor Strange they're and everyone, they're, they're all in Fortnite already. So this yeah. is why it's strange for this quarter. It's like, I didn't really know what to say. So I just, I just yep. said we discovered video games. It's like, like wait till you guys know about this. Someone just said in chat, wait till they discover about prawn. <laughs> <laughs> Poor my Disney. <laughs> That's all we need. Disney help. <laughs> no, I but mean, Disney, I, like, they have so many IPs in terms of video games. They can make so much more money than they already are. I mean, we already saw with the league with Insomniac. I mean, they're they're making Wolverine right now. They have a Venom game coming out in 2025. That's Disney. Then they're going to have Spider-Man 3, then an X-Men game by 2030. There's so many IPs that they could use for video games. And, like, they, they I can't believe it took Bob this long. But then again, this is Bob Iger we're talking about, so I shouldn't be surprised. But Jesus Christ, dude, you have so much IP that you could make into the greatest games ever. And like, Th this is the problem, yeah. though. I don't want them to make any of those IPs into video games because I, I know say, what I feel they'll a make. Bit like an, an alien right now. Like, are we pretending like all these are going to be good? Is yeah, well, I mean, like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm pretty much sure that uh, ba Sweet Baby Inc. are going to be the cr creative consultants on all of these games. Oh, fuck my life if they are. They will God be. Man, like, like, it's Disney, Fortnite's of course they essentially have to just be. skins. And they'll probably make a few islands and like custom modes and stuff, but it's not going to have a story or anything for someone like Sweet Baby. No, that's true. Two. That's true. Yeah. I mean, 100% Sweet Baby will be involved with Wolverine and all of those games. I don't yeah, even doubt it. I'm pretty sure I saw in the leaks like Gene uh, Gray and Wolverine is it's not looking good. Middle Eastern or something. The, the leaks. And the like Wolverine they're, 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 already, they're already race swapping characters. Calypso, another another one of the uh, she's she was one of the uh, what were they called the Morlocks living like the sewers in the X Men. She's uh, she's been race swapped as well in the leagues. Like there's a lot of yeah. So I know there it's has, not all gonna be perfect. There has been some positive stuff like the Knights of the Old Republic stuff got cancelled after they hired somebody. I can't remember who it was. Some family writer to Mags, rewrite Mags the Maggio or something. Yeah, like she that. got fired, and then the entire project got cancelled. So that would have been a disaster, but they realized yeah. it was going to be a disaster before it even got out and cancelled it. So um, It's just it's I think crazy to me, because when you look up that lady who was supposed to write Nets of the Republic, you look up her, her old tweets, and her tweets are saying, I'm not a fan of Star Wars. I never liked Nets of the <laughs> yes. Old Republic. And it's like, well, why are yeah. you here? Was it, I wasn't swear to God, God one of the guidelines like, like, this, this from... video of like all the, the Marvel writers and like every single one of them was saying like, I've never read the comic books, not a mm -hmm. fan of them. I was told specifically to stay away from the source material. Uh, that makes me good at what I do. Like that's the mindset now. Like don't, yeah. don't yeah. know anything about where it came from. We want you to make your own 
new version, an improved version, a more diverse the, version. The, and I remember in, in that thing, they had the secret invasion director, and he's like, yeah, I never read the books. And I'm like, yeah, no shit you didn't, because that show was ass. It was horrible. Yeah. And then I remember seeing the Daredevil, the original version of Daredevil Born Again, and they said, oh, we're going to hire the writers of Arrow from the CW. And I was like, oh boy, this is going to be slop. And then they canceled it. And like, of course you guys did, because just... And then, oh, man, I'm so scared for Daredevil. I'm Taika like Waititi literally said he took did. Thor because he was poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, it, yeah. th there comes a point where it's like, it's not just the, the fact that that's why you did it, but you felt so confident that you could publicly admit that and you thought they'd have no impact on your career in the future. Yeah, like, Taika Waititi does, he's got no fucks to give, man. Yeah, he's got no, yeah. no much shame, right? Like making fun of his own film CG on, on a video. Which, <laughs> yes, yeah, like, leaving that, that was... bloom. <laughs> Everybody was just like, like in the comment section, was like, this feels gross, man. Like all the people who had to work on crunch time trying to get your film ready and you're just laughing at them. It's like, that's... Yeah, just throwing them under the bus. Thor Love and Thunder was ass. That movie was so bad. Nobody <laughs> liked Sorry, Christ. I'm just conscious baggage claim. We totally interrupted you earlier, so please have <laughs> oh, at it. No, no worries. You actually ended up saying it perfectly, which is that 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 kind of stipulation that stay as far away from the source material as possible. There's just no there's no respect for anything sort of that's come before, right? So I, that's why I didn't interject again. I mean, is that's, that that's mindset what... of like we're cool because we're not uh, we're not shackled to the comics, we're not shackled to the yeah. source material. We're telling our it's, own story. It's, it's yep. the Witcher Netflix all over again, right? Oh, the yeah. writers were like, oh yeah, we hate the Witcher. Then why are you writing the Witcher? And then they yeah. and they they talked we, to we Andre Sapkowski. He's the guy that made The Witcher, and he said uh, in an interview, he was like, "Yeah, I, I I gave the Netflix guys some notes, and they just threw it in the garbage." And I'm like, "Well, there you go." Well, That's when you bad. when you bring in all these people that have no talent, they're just there because of how they look or how they talk about you know activism, and just empty thoughts. There's no talent. So what are you going to do? You get these people are going to just rely on previous people who have talent but then they're going to take their work and they're going to mangle it this was one of the actually biggest themes of atlas shrugged if any of you have ever read that but that's an ayn rand book her probably her mag, considered her magnum opus and he she talks a lot about how the people the, the people who have hatred for art are the first ones to come and just use it and repurpose it and rely on it use the the you know the value that it has for in people's minds use it to stand on top of it and then just crush it into the ground it, well, it's so bad it, it's baffling but also it kind of makes sense why these talentless hacks would need to do that because they can't create anything of their own they would rather destroy art than see art exist without their name on it i i, I don't think it's that they would rather i mean it kind of is in a way what you're witnessing is a new moral order essentially being created y you are witnessing people who rather than believing you are what you do they mm. believe that you are good because of what you are and so if you look at echo everything that they advertise is well she's got one leg she can't talk she's deaf the, the story was good because it was an authentic representation of what she was and that is what that was the moral push of the story not mm. her acts and her deeds throughout the story in the first place and so it, it's not that they active they do actively want to destroy what came before but that's because they disagree on a moral level about what is good and what is evil and as long as that happens i don't think that can really coexist so one of those has to win and whatever wins will go into the future and create everything echo um, is the perfect example of what's wrong with everything they took a character that was essentially just an assassin that could read movements like taskmaster one of the avengers villains and they turned her into the most pandering superhero that's completely tonally doesn't make any sense in terms of street level superheroes. Tonally. You know that. what I mean? You think about it yeah, like all, all, the, all the street level Marvel characters, right? You got Daredevil, Super Sense, Spider Man swings around, whatever, Punisher, blah, blah, blah. They took Echo and went, oh, her name's Echo and she's native. So naturally she has to echo the powers of her native ancestors. <laughs> and she's from like a wooden <laughs> goddess tribe. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense with, 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 within the confines did, of the street level you, fighting you, thing. You know what I mean? Didn't you like that, the mud people? That was insane. The opening scene looked like Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy to me, but like worse. I couldn't believe but, it. I, I was watching, Echo, I watched the whole thing. In, in, like, sorry, I, I watched the whole thing in like one sitting, and my girlfriend was sitting beside me playing Yakuza. And the whole time I'm watching it, she said, I've never looked more disgusted in my entire life watching something. The scene at the <laughs> end where she, where she fights Kingpin and she puts her hands on his face and like, you know, just 
God. I don't know, mind shifts into his brain because she can do that now, apparently. She said that my face when that happened was like I, I I just saw like my my dog die or something. Like I was losing my mind how bad it was. It was like the but, one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. I'm not kidding you. I think Echo is the worst thing Marvel has ever made. Did you watch Secret now. Invasion? I did. <laughs> and that's not as bad as Echo, in my opinion. Echo was horrific. I think Echo I thought was Secret, Secret Invasion was worse. Yeah, especially really? that, that, that like was scene. Than Echo. Yeah. Jesus. I, I, I just can't I believe went, it. But most of Echo was just nothing. There was like barely anything in it. But mm. the, the stuff that was in it was terrible. I'm not disagreeing on that. But th they both share the they... same problem. It's like with Echo, they didn't make Echo a good character. She was supposed to be the hero, but she was still a criminal who just wanted to take over a criminal empire and was happy to kill people, whoever they were. But she was good because she was indigenous and deaf and had one leg. That was what gave her the righteous side of that entire story despite the fact that she didn't do anything good with any of it and actually brought war to her family, which seems like a really stupid thing to do. Yep. And then in Secret Invasion, you also had the same thing, where it's like people are coming down to wipe out humanity, but they're supposed to be the good guys because a nine-year-old broke a promise to well, them? Dude, like, if we can remind the, the damage of Secret Invasion, it destroys, like, annihilates Fury. Not that there wasn't much left anyway, but, you know, still, they, they completely rewrote his history. They yes. do significant, like, they, all of the scrolls are fucked. The species is just done after Secret Invasion. There's nothing redeemable about them now. Well, They're until like the Marvels. No. Oh, <laughs> like, the the <laughs> Marvels just forget Secret Invasion exists. Oh, That's true, like, but yeah. we didn't forget. <laughs> We're watching it. Then, of course, they've they've invented a brand new female character who now has all of the uh, the power of all the Avengers, and she's oh, just yeah. Yeah. there now. So I can enjoy that. And I guess what I'm getting at is like, you know, and they kill Maria Hill very unceremoniously. So I guess what I'm saying mm. is like, we have the damage that they've done to someone like Echo in Secret Invasion, but they've also damaged like a bunch of legacy stuff, which is, again, most of I the... think I think that's honestly one of my least favorite things about a lot of media today is that a lot of things are getting made today that aren't just that aren't just bad on their own, but they're retroactively making previous works worse. Remember oh, and that's something that really drives me insane about a lot of things. You okay. could apply that to Star Wars, you could apply that to Marvel, really yeah. like... For example, Secret Invasion, right? Rhodey's yeah. a scroll, which makes no sense now. So yeah. when Rhodey's hugging dead Tony Stark, that's not Rhodey. That's not so Rhodey. retroactively Rody. made Endgame so work. I, I, I think Rody they, doesn't they, they know didn't that even, Tony's dead. They didn't even consider that when they made the show. I, I guarantee yeah. you they never even thought about the no. repercussions of that. They just did it because they thought yeah. it was a cool idea. There's so many retroactive bad things. Like, you remember in, uh, what was it? Captain America Winter Soldier, I believe, when... Fury pulls up his, his eye patch and says, keep both eyes open. And we're all like, oh, mm. how did he get that blind eye? And then we find out later, oh, a cat scratched. Oh, so oh yeah. That was makes so it dumb. Classic. Yeah, it's Come one of the on. worst things. It made him such a badass character to kind of, because he says, you know, the last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. And you just think about that there's this dark, past where he kind of learned his how to be this grittier version of himself to survive you know he's this incredible agent and then you know it's just the dumbest possible story so that they can have kind of a a laugh about a cat yeah. it's the same reason why i hate echo so much is because it retroactively makes kingpin even worse hmm. and i thought kingpin's one of the best marvel villains even oh, though yeah. he got like, ruined they, once they are going to keep MCU. They're going to keep wheeling him out until he is completely and mm -hmm. utterly used up. They've squeezed <laughs> yeah, every, like, every how, bit of creative Thanos. juice they can like, get out of Just him. think about it, right? You watch you watch Daredevil season one, two, and three. Kingpin is so scary that that one criminal guy in season one, when he tells Daredevil who Kingpin is, instead of staying alive, he literally shoves his head through a spike because that's a better ending to him than to stay alive in order for Kingpin to do something to him. That's how scary he is. He decapitates that other guy with the car door. Then you watch the MCU version of Kingpin. Very first time you see him, he gets launched through a window by 110 pound Kate Bishop. Nothing happens to her. She gets away with it. And she goes and has like Christmas dinner with Hawkeye. Then he shows up again, only to get like the toxic masculinity sucked out of him or something by Echo. And it's just like, you're ruining everything on purpose. And it keeps happening. And it's not just Marvel. It's Star Wars. It's everything. What's particularly tragic about that is how Charlie Cox and Vincent D'Onofrio are aware of how much the fans are desperate for the content to continue, and that from their perspective, they're like, "That's what we're doing, guys. We're getting it back on, on, on. You know, on <laughs> it's, it's happening." And like trying to be supportive, trying to get it all back to where it was, where everybody's enjoying what the artists are making. The artists get to celebrate that on social media, but it's so fucked now that it's like Vincent D'Onofrio's like, "Yeah, Echo, that was that was great," and you're just like. Mm. 
Yeah, well, they, I remember got that very telling interview where he's like, "So, as an actor, it's my job to, yeah, <sighs> like do my best with this script, I suppose." <laughs> like, that's the thing. What else can he, he do? He so shows up. He does his yeah. job as the character. Like that scene with Echo trying to heal his childhood trauma was so fucking oh, bullshit. But so what could bad. you do if you're the actor? You're like, I guess I gotta. But the the best thing about surprised. that interview, yeah. they asked him. Uh, what was the thing that was missing from the script that you feel like you added in that was the best part about it? And he said, emotion. <laughs> the, the, wow. Like, at, how more? He said, yeah, uh, it, it, he was a more dangerous character when he added in emotion to the father and daughter bond. It's like, it was the worst. You know they don't know anything. They they couldn't even get the same hammer right that he used to kill his father. And <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. They got Every a different cast. hammer. <laughs> and then not only that, I, I remember reading that the people that wrote Echo... They didn't even watch Daredevil. They watched a supercut version of the Kingpin scenes from Daredevil, and then they used that to write his character. So they didn't even watch Daredevil when they wrote a show that's supposed to be like you a... Know that's, imagine if you're that. You're working on a $200 million show, and you couldn't even be bothered to devote like maybe 10, 15 hours of your life to, yeah. to watch the, the previous... The they just, they just watched the supercut and went, and went, oh yeah, Kingpin? Okay, he's a bald white guy. He's really angry. Talks to masculinity. We got it. We know who that is. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, my God, guys, no wonder this is garbage. It's the kind of thing I just don't understand because rewatching it is even like a, in a pragmatic way going to get you able to people, even if you hate it, right? Let's say you hate the this, this stuff. It's like, I can at least manipulate the fans into liking it by referencing old stuff, like a, an almost an evil pragmatic uh, reason to do something like that. But every time they show such disdain toward ever doing it. No, I because they they assume that you hammer. are like them. <laughs> like, they they a can't strong imagine empowered <laughs> female hammer. They can't conceptualize, so they can't imagine the world from anyone else's point of view except their own. So that when they think, well, it's indigenous and deaf and blind, and we sign, hmm. that's what's good about the show to them. And so they just assume the audience is exactly the same. They don't think they need to care yeah, about him because they care about something else and just assume everyone else is like them. Uh, yeah, there are show. those people. There are those people who exist in life that kind of go around just uh, looking for everything to be, uh, you know, they're they're looking to be offended. They're looking to have problems. They're talking about their problems. I was at the DMV for something, and the person in front of me, I couldn't really tell what their gender was. I live in San Francisco. That's this is a common occurrence, and this person <laughs> was talking to their their friend. And just talking about, oh, that it's hard for them to watch Legally Blonde because of their ADHD, because the emotions are so all over the place that it makes it really hard for them to follow along and keep up with it. And I thought, I all I could think about was that, how does this person even get out of bed every day? They can't watch Legally Blonde. And there are so many, and you can only have a complaint like this in, in a prosperous society where everything is kind of done for you, where, you know, you, you don't have to leave your couch if you want to eat a burger. You don't have to, mm. you know, you can, you can have every one of your needs met very easily in, in a society like this. And that's why this person has the luxury to be this useless and this, um, you know, ready to complain about even the most basic things. This person cannot handle it any difficult situation in their life i think uh, people with a negative mindset will find things to be miserable about like even if you gave them like 10 million dollars or whatever like they would find a reason to be unhappy about that like oh, i can't fit it all into my wallet it's so unfair call them the english <laughs> you know, I, it, like you say it is just it comes down to boredom it comes down to like to having too much luxury too much leisure time too easy a life where you can just obsess over your own problems and your own shortcomings Which forever. Which is why, when you guys say like, oh, you should wear a helmet when you eat food. It's like, they don't know how to use a helmet. Why would you ever even suggest that? For <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> and it, yeah, it is just, like, you, there's almost no help in people like that because they will always find a reason to be miserable and they'll find something to, to have a problem with that they can't cope with. I, uh, I remember reading a, uh, there was a report about how a lot of companies are actually going out of their way not to hire people that have multiple pronouns in their bios because they're seen as liabilities, which I think is great. I don't, I don't think that's entirely that unfair either. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, yeah, that, that, that kind of person just screams like a potential lawsuit, like yeah. further down the line. It's like, why would you hire them? I like, I like this term toxic sensitivity. sensitivity. 
I like that. That's yeah. Well done. Add, Add that far to, to the, the far far wall wall sensitivity. Sensitivity. There you go. Yeah. The, there is an interesting argument though. It, it's like, well, okay, even if it's like our, cult, our countries are so amazing and so soft, and no one's been through any challenges that they get to like this, but then you still have places like Korea where, <laughs> what, like, Badland Hunters is a movie like would have existed in the 90s is an action movie it's very predictable but it is just an incredible movie everyone acts like you were supposed to it's just a great action movie it's a fun time but one of the interesting things in the fight scenes uh there's a woman who's part of the action scenes but she moves by like dodging and using people's momentum against them but if mm -hmm. any time it comes head to head with a bloke she just loses like if he punches her and she tries to block him she just loses um mm. and that is realistic and they build that into the fight and it's all natural and it immerses you in the fight and we don't get that over here mm -hmm. so even if you're like well everyone is comfortable in these countries they they're still grounded in reality and they're not scared to go this is a weakness of this group compared to what we are it's like no we have to treat everyone the same even if it doesn't exist even if everybody yeah. knows that's a lie we yeah. still try and do it and pre like pretend which is when you see a hundred and ten people. pound person punch you it's just like, sorry, go ahead. Just yeah, whenever yeah. I see like a really small girl hit a guy, it's like this is not realistic. It, it offends those those groups that you mentioned because it implies that like they are just inherently weaker than mm. other people, and you can't have that. It's not allowed now because it's too offensive, and so you have to just go along with this lie that like, yes, all humans are exactly identical, regardless of their size, their strength, their muscle mass, whatever. Uh, they they can all like hold the hold their own in a fight with each other because that's just how reality works don't question it just move on and but yeah fine it makes that the makes fights... you feel better but like the moment you get into an actual real fight and you weigh like two like a hundred pounds less than your opponent <laughs> yeah you're, you're gonna get your ass kicked sorry the thing is, it makes reality. the fights more interesting because you'll have the blokes going head to head just punching people and blocking people whereas she has a different fighting style she's trying to yeah. do the blows she's trying to use the environment against her or use like holds and leverage to mm. her advantage and so she fights different than all the other men on her team but then at some point the guy will just hit her and there's nothing she can do about it um and so it adds it makes the characters different whereas what you end up now you, you feel like you've watched the same movie a thousand times yep. because if everyone's equal i i've seen this before and i'm bored mm. yeah but this is well, all I mean, it's just like there's that inherently logical part of your brain that just tells you this doesn't make sense. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. If, if I see like a, a you know a hundred pound woman get into a grapple with a, a two hundred pound man and she's like holding her own, so like they've fought to a standstill, I my brain's just telling me though this is stupid. Like this wouldn't happen. And so I'm taken out of the movie, and I know this is just the the writers projecting what they want to be true onto the audience rather than trying to represent what would actually happen. Like you say, Disbrew, you can make it work. You can make fight scenes like that work. You just have to get a little bit more creative and a little bit more imaginative with it. That's why but there's a great scene that. in uh, in in Reacher season two where Dixon, that's one of the women on the team, they're in this house and they're all fighting. They're all fighting these like dudes that are like hiding in the house, and she's like a special operative or whatever. But she's still fighting a man that's much bigger than her, and he ends up overpowering her, and then like you know almost kills her, and then of course she gets saved by someone else. But I felt like that's realistic, you know, like. If you have a woman that's like 110, 20 pounds, she's not going to be able to take on a guy that's 200 pounds. Like, let's be real. I'm 250 pounds. If I, if I wore a wig and joined a women's arm wrestling tournament, I wouldn't have to work out. I would get first place, no problem. You know what I mean? Like, none <laughs> of them are going to turn it into a video. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. you look at uh, Sicario, there's a moment where Emily Blunt tries to punch Josh Brolin in the face and like she wallops someone and it, it does almost nothing. And he's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> they like just th knocks her on her arse because that's what would really happen in real life if two vastly mismatched people like that tried to get into a scrap. But like I, um, most mainstream Hollywood movies won't show that. There are yeah. not to be the contrarian, but there are ways to make a scene where a woman beats a man in a in a straight fight. Obviously, it's usually environment or objects, but also as, as far as I'm aware, I feel like a dick today. I guess, but like I think arm wrestling has got a lot of style and techniques you probably still would lose i don't know this is just raw strength right i That's would i would bet money it I is largely far, though assuming well, that the what, leverage I, is exactly the same so the distance across the table and stuff, i could have it's sworn i've seen strength. videos where you have like the big muscly bulky man gets annihilated by someone who's got like a tiny arm because they know how the leverage works oh interesting. Well, yeah but the leverage is basically how far your elbow is across <laughs> it's not that complicated 
there's partly that there's there's this, this weird um, aspect of hu human physiology as well called fast twitch muscle fibers where you can have an explosive burst of strength mm. just for a second or so which kind of like you know you can do it with relatively small muscle mass in your arm um, but you wouldn't be able to hold them like in the long run so you just relies on like overwhelming them but again <sighs> Fucking hell! Men like, have more fast muscles. It, it, yeah, oh, and it, again, if you pitch like a guy with a, like a huge muscly arms, like a bodybuilder or something, against a woman that's like a hundred pounds lighter than him, she's she's not going to win, regardless of how much technique she might be able to bring to bear. Like that's if I was in a woman's arm wrestling competition, I'd put money on myself. I'm that confident. I could make it pretty far. <laughs> and I'll win it. I could do it. Okay. But this is all. What, this is, what about the I John think... Cole fight with the the like two hundred pound Asian lady who beats up the like four hundred pound dudes? Because you, you, I assume you guys were okay with that. Because she like climbs around them and you know stab, 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 slice, sort of. Yeah, thing. well, I think but once you bring weapons into lose, it, like it's very different. You know, if a well, the... person's got a knife and the other person isn't, like, well, okay, you can stab them and stuff, and like, fine, like that overrides she... the physical strength aspect of it. Which well, like we you know. About? Like uh, the one, it ends on like a staircase. I think is near the beginning. No, what was the movie? Sorry, I missed the stuff. Uh, John, John McFall. John McFall. Oh yeah, no, yeah, is, I like that. Like, yeah, because he's crawling she's up fighting the stairs. Really... Isn't he? She's just knifing him in the back. Yeah, she and not? she's fighting really big dudes, and she's on the floor crawling around their ankles. It's like well, it that's is... kind of what I'm getting at with technique. Yeah, I, I have no problem if, if you give a reason. I don't care. You know, it, it, as long as it makes sense. But I think a lot of this people underestimate how much of an influence like instinct has. We know truths your body knows your mind rejects and there is a limit of what you can do and if if something doesn't make any sense at all your brain rejects it and mm. so you have to give some kind of in world in universe reason about why this is happening as long as it makes sense i have no problem with it like i say in badland hunters she does fight people but there's a reason why she wins those fights and it is literally if if you both of them punch people to the face she will lose but there's also other things she can do where she uses different type of fighting and wins the fights. Uh, it's just about making it realistic. Or give them superpowers. Well, that, yeah, that's like the Gaia, easy that's the yeah. Yeah, I have super three card, isn't like, it? Yeah, yeah. The Buffy. The, uh, no one has a problem with Buffy. She's magic. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is mystical power. Can you imagine yeah. if, they, if, they, if they remade Buffy today, how bad it would be? It would be... Oh, God. So it, it, the funny thing about Buffy is when, when I heard that like Anita Sarkeesian was a huge fan of it, I, I, uh -oh. I was like, I don't know how. <laughs> that she would be a huge if you were to watch Buffy now, you'd be like, Holy shit. If this was replayed today and everyone was forced to watch it who claims to be a mega fan, a lot of them would say this is this is problematic. This is way too problematic. Like, yeah, she's uh, actually girly in her interests. Yes. And they let her be girly in her interests. That is not and allowed she's, today. She's straight as well, which isn't allowed. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. uh, and she's true. sentimental. That's not allowed. She's into makeup. That's not allowed. Yeah. I, that, well, and she, it's funny because we did retarded perfectly nail the, the thing that made like, Buffy so compelling, where it's like you have what seems to be a small, lightly built, weak, uh, feminine, girly girl, but like the kind of girl who would wander into a dark alley and get accosted by like a, a mugger, or in this case, a vampire. Like, but then you find out, well, no, she's not going to get killed by the monster. She is the fucking monster in this case. It's great. It's, it makes for a nice, uh, a nice contrast in your expectations. But they wouldn't but get that nowadays. They would have to be so on the nose with it. Also in Buffy, though, they didn't drag down the other characters to prove how amazing she was. You did yeah. have uh, other blokes and stuff that were as strong or went through their own character arcs um, that got stronger in their own right. And so, yeah, she's the main character. So when she gets into a fight, you really know she's not going to die. But there was still, it still felt like the tension was there when she was fighting Angel. There was still, you know, she could, when she was fighting Spike, Spike had killed uh, people oh, like no. her before. Two Slayers, yeah. She, uh, she hasn't gone there yet, I think. No, she has. Uh, she's, 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 she has. I, I mean, I'm sorry. This yeah. thing came out like 15 <laughs> years ago. I know, I know, I know. It's okay. It's my own damn fault, but I'm on season three. So Look, Buffy I'm just doesn't gonna... die halfway you're, you're, through a series. I don't think that's <laughs> not a everything, everything just proves said it's season two. She fights Angel oh, in season okay. two, and she, she fought Spike, who'd beaten two slayers in season two. She's nearly bitten by Spike. I think she's saved a couple of times because he's a pretty good fighter. Yes, um, yeah. but Disbru is is correct. Even though she's super powered, she still enters fights where she loses miserably. I think. Um, Later seasons, I'll be nice and vague. Later seasons, she has a fight that they assume she dies from it because she's so beaten up from it. Like, uh, mm. and they're like terrified getting her What's home. What's the name they, they... of Spike's actor, James Marsden? Is that it? Marsden. Mar Mar okay, Marsden. There you go. Yeah. Um, and he yeah, was and Piccolo then, and then... in Dragon Ball Evolution. Yes, he was. Unfortunately. Um, 
And as a badge claim referenced, Helpless was the episode she was talking about where she's, her power's taken away, and they make several references to how she needs to be careful when going home. She needs to be, like, she even asks, like, Cordelia for help. Yes. It's yeah, uh, never yeah. had to deal with this I, and before. The, the lesson of that was that you shouldn't rely on your powers. Like, you, 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 there are still other parts of it that you can use rather than just relying on the magic all the time. And you don't get that anymore. You don't... There used to be lessons like that that taught people something in shows, and you don't really get that anymore. Like, what, what's the lesson of Echo? That you should just be a criminal and invade tribes? I, I, like, you should seek power. Well, so it's it's seek funny, just because power. you bring it up about um, the other movie or whatever, but I got that impression in Echo where she blames, like, her grandmother for not being there for her. She blames her friend or whatever for whatever thing, and then yes, King Pin yeah. for being a bad influence. It's just like, yeah, yeah, none of this is your fault. No choices were mm -hmm. made by you. <laughs> it's all well, everyone else. Like, you know, it's a Marvel show. Of course, like, she can't take responsibility for her own fuck-ups. Like, it has to be other people's faults. You know what the best part about Echo was? When, um... Her mom shows that she has the power to heal a bird that Echo hurt. And then when Echo's dad is dying from a wound, she doesn't heal him, even though she can. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Just great writing. Well, I love how the much part where her where her where her foot gets stuck in the train, and then she becomes like Avatar the Last Airbender and like bends the air to get her leg out. And then she never uses that power ever again in the entire show. You have to understand I, I she just keeps doing that. Is randomly deciding when they're gonna actually play any it's part such in the nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, you don't think right. she's actually going to help a man, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> they could have had a great show that was just in New York City. She's fighting criminals with her power where she just... She's called Echo because she literally just mimics the movements of who she's fighting. That makes her deadly in close quarters combat. But no. But that would be lame. Okay, uh, show yeah. <laughs> and the fact that they put her in like the native outfit too, I was like, yeah, you guys did not read the comics, clearly. Ooh, we all awful. watched The Boys, Cringe. which took the piss out of that oh, before you even oh. made the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, and the other it thing didn't was... even look good on her. I mean, it was just such a terrible outfit on top of it. Yeah. It, was, it, was it, was it was like a bad cosplay. It was like the... Yeah. I was I wanted to wear a Halloween outfit. This is all I could find. Sorry. Um but yeah, the other thing I was going to talk about before I did some super chats was um, George R. R. Martin, everyone's oh. favorite author who produces nothing in the past ten years. Um, he he's given his opinions on the world of fandoms because you know it's just it's so terribly hard doing nothing these days, and um, you know taking about a decade to write a single novel. Uh, but he says, and this is this was a great little quote from him. It was on his blog actually. Um, it was a post entitled Dark Days. It says, current mood, depressed. <laughs> this year, though, I reflected on the year that we've just lived through. I found I had no appetite for living through any of that again. 2023 was a nightmare of a year for the world and the nation and for me and mine, both professionally and personally. I'm very glad that it's over. Unfortunately, 2024 looks to be even worse. While I take solace where I can, in chocolate thrones, if nowhere else, yeah, no kidding, George, uh, in books and <laughs> films, television shows, though even there, toxicity is growing. It used to be fun talking about our favorite books and films and having spirited debates with fans who saw things different. But somehow in this age of social media, it's no longer enough to say, I didn't like book X or film Y and here's why. Now social media is ruled by anti-fans who would rather talk about the stuff that they hate than the stuff they love and delight in dancing on the graves of anyone whose film has flopped. Which I thought was an interesting comment because he seems to miss the inherent contradiction there where you do get to say, I didn't like book X or film Y, and here's mm -hmm. why. I can well, tell you the reasons why I didn't like it. Well, the, uh, confirmed, George R. R. Martin watches YouTube, so that's good. That's a good thing. Um, but Write the well, damn book, George. But <laughs> you're here, here's this. the deal. I was talking with Gary about this Captain Nerdrotic um, earlier this week. This conversation, the type of conversation we're having now, the type of conversations you hear on FNT and a lot of other shows, that has been the same since I've been around fandom. And I've been around fandom, obviously, a long time. Gone to conventions. This is, I didn't go to my comic book store necessarily to buy comics, although I did buy comics there. I went there for the conversation that would evolve over what's happening in comics. And I think that's why we're all here. This is, this, this is why, I mean, I discovered, um, you know, a lot of you from FNT, right? Like that is just a normal nerd conversation with people that are very passionate about 
uh, particular fandoms. It's it's no different than any conversation I'd have at a video store or a comic book store. It's just now that like now we're having it in front of people who can actually chime in. So uh, I, I'm surprised that George would react that way. You think he you think he was he'd no better. I think he's just making excuses. And uh, I don't know. I think it's 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 really sad to see. Just stop everything and write the book. Get, get you know, literally drop the mic. And also, according to Gary, he has reached out to potential co-writers who could help him finish. And Good. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with teaming up with some co-writer to get it across the finish line and finish the book. Um, and I now I'm so glad I never watched Echo because I didn't listening to all of you. Um, You're welcome. Um, the the he, thing is, yeah. th there's only a, there's only one reason why you get to the point where the fans actively want your project to fail, and that's if you act like a complete and total asshole yeah. towards them, where you denigrate yes. the fans, where you try to paint them as ists and phobes, uh, where you blame them for all of your shortcomings and for not liking the slop that you've dished up to them, or the slop that you haven't dished up to them in about a decade. You know, that that's... You don't get to just tar them all with that brush and say, well, they're all just toxic because they don't just accept whatever I choose to do. They're fans, but they're only going to be fans as long as you do things that please them, whether it's giving them um, the, the product that they want, whether it's providing good entertainment for them, or at least giving them timely updates on your progress. If you don't do any of those things and people get pissed off, well, guess what, George? They've got every fucking right to do that. And I, yeah. I think, at least for us anyway, I don't think, I don't consider anyone really here, anyone watching as toxic per se. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we hated these things. You know, the reason why we're so passionate about whatever it is, like Mahler for Star Wars, for example, it's because we love these things. We don't want to see them get ruined. I mean, that's right. a big reason why, you know, I cover video games, right? Because I love video games so much that I don't want to see it get ruined. And I don't think any of us are just covering it because it's like, oh, we hate these things. It's like, no. Uh, like in, I would love to see Marvel, Star Wars, Western gaming, whatever. I would love for all of it to be doing amazing right now. But the truth is that it isn't, and it doesn't make us toxic for wanting to discuss about it. You know, have a community about it and whatever. I think he's taking the wrong um, angle from this. I talked about George in my most recent video that came out today, so I'm a little like you know capped up on what he's been saying, and I don't agree with him at all. I, I don't find us to be toxic at all. If anything, it feels like we're the only sane ones. If that and makes I think, any sense. I, I think it, it's easy to get wrapped up in the defense aspect, which I actually think is the point. Um, that if someone insults you, you're like, well, I'm not like that. So you start defending yourself. Um, and so if if you read the the rest of the blog and the start of it, he, he talks a lot about the actual world and he's he's like, uh, why do I not leave a legacy in this world? What do have I even left an impact? Have I changed anyone's mind? Have I changed the way people think about the world? And then he goes into, I really like having a conversation about people who disagree with me, but now they're all toxic. And it, to me, if you take the entire thing as a whole, it seems like it's like he, he doesn't mind having a conversation with people, but they have to agree with him by the end. And the entire point of that is to change the actual world. And so when he's calling people toxic fans by toxic, it, the entire point is you have a diff difference of opinion to me. So if you're like, well, I'm not toxic, by his definition, you are toxic because you're disagreeing with him. He knows the right way that the world should exist. You don't agree with him. Therefore, by definition, you are a bad thing. And if you start, uh, if you start defending yourself, you get sidetracked from the actual point, which is what you are doing is awful. What you are doing is trying to influence people through writing rather than entertaining them in the first place and I, I've, I've always thought taking the defensive attitude on this doesn't get you anywhere it is more the, the problem is you the problem is you george the problem is what you want to do in this writing the problem is the fact that you want to use entertainment to influence the world rather than entertain people you're using your career as a, a way to attack people and kind of morph it into something it shouldn't be you are the problem not everybody else and, I, and so I'd, i've never really liked having to defend yourself as toxic it's like i think your actions speak for yourself i think your videos speak for yourself and your content does and so when somebody says something like that it's it's more about what they do rather than what you do yeah and i i wonder if i know chris was suggesting that maybe uh 
George R. R. Martin is watching YouTube channels. And I, I wonder if that is true or if he's just reading headlines that paint this wide picture of what the fans are doing on YouTube. Because you, you say something enough and, and it becomes this truth that a lot of people believe because they don't spend the time actually diving into the reality of things. And then anything that comes to them relating to that topic in the real world, it just kind of reaffirms their belief, right? Because they're looking at it from that lens of, well, fans are toxic, fans are toxic, fans are toxic. And it's the same, you know, there was that viral uh, video going around on on Twitter of a teacher asking a student, why do you think JK, JK Rowling is transphobic? But he's just heard that so many times that when they actually take some time to do some critical thinking, and he dives into what the tweets that she made that were supposedly transphobic actually were, he realizes and he says it, he says, I feel kind of like a fool. And there's just there's just so much media pushing that that argument that fans are toxic. They're toxic. They're, you know, they're these men and they paint this picture that they they're just they want to hang on to control, you know, they want to hang on to their toxic masculinity and control. They don't like that women are involved. They don't like that diverse groups are involved. And that's just that that vast uh belief. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, I know for a fact that Gary Beekler was on a tour of the Orville television show by invitation on the same tour was an entourage of people that included George R. R. Martin who shook everyone's hand. And when it got wow. to Gary, he looked away. He wow. knew who Gary <laughs> was. Gary's told this story several times, many times actually. Mm -hmm. So you can ask him about it directly, but um, I believe he, you. I believe you. Yeah, he he knows that there is discontent with regard to his choices oh, yeah. of uh you know try how you know allotting his time. So I think it's I think I don't know. I, you know I, I just think it'd just be so easy to make it all go away by yep. teaming up with someone. He's not a young man and finish the story. Brandon I think Sanderson just would do an incredible job just like he did with the Wheel of Time. Like, I think maybe just like, apologizing as well for how long it's taken and just giving some sort of explanation instead of like, well, the impression I get from his previous posts is that he acts like a bit of a petulant child. Like, oh, why do you keep hassling me about this? Just leave me alone. He can give why the apology once to he deliver stuff? releases something. I think you should just shut the fuck up, work complete, and then apologize and release. This That should be the thing that happens. But well, at this point, yeah, this book, there's more afterwards. So he's of course, like, of course, so at least much stuff if he released do, something, we could then have hope that he's making things. But what I was going to bring up as well is the unfortunate thing with Gary and with many others, who knows how he gets his information, if it's people telling him what people say about him or if he sees mm, it himself or if he looks likely, at quotes right. or summaries, because, you know, a lot of people on, on the Internet despise us for things we've literally never said. Like it's it's gotten insane at this point with like uh, cultural bubbles. But something that, that annoyed me about what some of his wording is like, oh, it used to be such a great thing to talk about our favorite stuff. And it's like, if anything, I might argue it's better now than it was however long ago, because a lot of these conversations about our favorite things are prompted by comparison to newer stuff. And so it gives us a bit of an oomph to be like, oh, I'll explain it now. Instead of us watching, you know, Lord of the Rings when it comes out, maybe enjoying it and maybe explaining how it's working, blah, blah, blah. But like these days will be like drilled down into specific, you know, writing arcs and how they're built and where they come from and you know, how it compares to the book, because we want to make sure we understand why it's failing now versus then. Instead of agreeing we all enjoy a thing and being happy, now we might, you know, want to drive home very specific comparisons. And some of those made me think about this. I did two Suicide Squad streams, and I already did three Arkham Asylum streams after it, and I'm planning on doing City after that. And it's like, I love those games. What? Yeah, I love them too. And it's like, it's why? So it's like, well, because it's a fucking, let's go back and appreciate them, talk about their differences and see the differences for ourselves instead of just talking about how, oh, no, they were better, trust me, sort of things. Like, no, we'll, we'll actually go and do it. And there's a cool tweet I just spotted that says, um, Arkham Knight player count has increased by 51% since the release of Suicide Squad. <laughs> like, <laughs> and if you want to look you at the actual up to date, you know, you to happier days. Suicide Squad peaked today at a nearly 5,000 players, which is shrinking every day, by the way. Um, Arkham Knight today had three and a half thousand. So give it another week, maybe, and Arkham Knight will here's take the, over. Here's the like thing, point. though, about that, about the whole Batman thing. Another reason why the Batman Arkham games are so beloved, they're written by Bruce Tim, the guy that wrote, the guy that made the Batman, the animated series. Suicide Squad's not made or written by him at all. And it also brings up another point, I remember, just showing you how out of touch these people are. Obviously, I know Chris Gore from you know G4 Tech TV back in the day. When they did that revival, uh, I remember reading an article that I had one of my videos recently. There was a streamer named Miss Click, I think her name was, and she was being interviewed for that G4 revival. 
And uh, one of the questions that the people asked her in order for her to get hired was, okay, we want to ask you, wh wh why should we cancel Batman? That was like oh, a yeah. question that she was unironically asked. And she's like, what do you mean cancel Batman? What does that mean? She's like, well, he's, you know, he's a rich white guy who beats up the, you know, the impoverished and whatever. And like, he's, if, 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 uh, if, if Batman was not white, basically he could not get away with the things that he could. And she's wow. like, I don't, I don't think we should cancel Batman. And um, she's like, like, so you wouldn't mind if a white man was saving you in the middle of Gotham City in a hypothetical situation? And she's like, I don't care who would save me because if I'm getting my ass kicked or robbed in the middle of somewhere. Like I, anyone can save me. It doesn't matter who it is. And then she was uh, being asked uh, beyond that, like, OK, beyond Batman, like what other characters would you cancel for being, you know, white and stuff? And she brought up the Punisher because she didn't agree with what they were saying. But this streamer was basically just trying to, you know say something to get the interview process going so it's no surprise that the whole g4 revival thing didn't work because from the get-go they were hiring people that were very clearly not a good voice for the community you know what i mean it looks like right, chris well, wants to say something so yeah well know. just um i had nothing to do with the relaunch of g4 <laughs> Absolutely yeah. zero not me folks yeah. it wasn't me I, you know there was initial discussion that some of the older G4 ca cast from the original cast would actually come on the show to make appearances. I suggested as a joke, I said, you should just bring them on and kill, kill us off one by one. Just like <laughs> Disney did with the legacy star Wars characters. <laughs> we each come on and they murder us and then we're it's done. Um, but yeah. And then maybe we were going to do the reunion, but that was during COVID nonsense. And so, yeah, I had nothing to do with it and it is what it is. And there are people that I used to work with who I really like. That were there but it was ill-conceived from the beginning clearly it did not resonate and you know like a lot of like you know like a lot you insult your fans it's like what are you what are you doing that's your well, audience the audience can just say okay next it's, it must it's have so been stupid that's, it must have been painful to watch what it became when they relaunched it like you you've yes. taken this corpse of g4 tv and you're just parading it around now and then sodomizing it in front of our eyes well especially because i was the only person that actually spoke to people like i've always like i'll talk to anybody i don't care i talk to people i agree with people i disagree with i like to have conversation i like to i actually think that diversity of thought is the kind of diversity that is the only thing that matters and unfortunately that's not one mm -hmm. that a lot of people put a lot of effort into, but then I was the only person that would talk to people. So everyone at G4 is just this sort of wall of silence. And then they would just shit post on social media, which doesn't help anything. And I'm sitting here. I've always been, I always like to, you know, I like to look at all sides of a thing. I'd like to be kind of a voice of reason. I will respect someone. Even if, even if we're disagreeing about it, can we have an honest conversation? Sure. Let's, let's do that. But um, so I kind of got caught up, but I just ignored it. And I made the movie I wanted to make, which uh, the attack of the doc, which is just, it's, it's about then. And there's an offhand couple mentions of the new G4. And I think, uh, I think by not saying something, I actually was intentionally saying something. The, the so interesting thing, seen the and I do recommend attack of the doc, by the way, I watched it and it was very yes. enjoyable. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Very, very the good. The interesting thing about your idea of you could bring the old cast on and kill them one by one, you could actually pull that off if you had <laughs> earned it. Like, if you would right. come up with a new show that was original, but also had, like, a humorous tone, they'd be like, we have now earned your opinion and you like us, and now we're going to do something to the other half. But it's all in good fun, like, we respect them and everything, but also, right. we're doing our own thing, and... If you get the people on your side, you can get away with that. It, it's only yeah. if you feel like you're riding on someone else's coattails, using their kind of reputation for you, but also hate them in a way. People don't like the spite of it all. And gaming is something especially unique in a way because it's got the gameplay aspect. You're on about Sweet Baby Inc. and the other stuff. It's like, yeah, they destroyed the story. But if you look at like Payday, Payday 2 into Payday 3, um, there's a lot of the people in charge of that are the same people. And it's kind of pure gameplay. The story doesn't really mean anything. But more people are playing Payday 2 than Payday 3 simply because the gameplay is better. The getting into the game is better. It's purely the mechanics is better. And I think one of the aspects with this, it's not just that you attract people with a certain belief system, but you attract people who 
value kind of weakness and they didn't get there because because they had the best ideas they got there for the reasons and so it affects everything if you have an ideology that values being a victim and being weak you attract those people and those people make bad things and they make bad mechanics as well as bad stories and so it affects everything all the way down the chain to the point where you you can't really get out of it once they're in your company because literally every aspect of your company will now be destroyed yep there, uh, there's just this one quick, explanation uh, oh yeah go ahead go ahead i'll talk after oh, no no just real quick to kind of wrap up on that point is i've found for the most part having been around gaming most gamers are apolitical that you know what they they you know what they're like maybe i'm this maybe whatever I, you know i like games mostly apolitical when g4 chose chose to cater to one side of the political aisle that was a colossal mistake and uh, maybe a more controversial take. I don't even think that what Frost was saying initially was <laughs> wrong. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, like uh, people, but also, by the way, everyone gets shit when you play a multiplayer game and you're in one of those rooms and you're wait. People talk shit, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever. Nobody cares. You talk shit. That's the way <laughs> it is. The uh, the uh, the way to actually perhaps offer something would be to uh, temper it with humor which is something the yes. old G4 would have done is here's Olivia's giant panty pile where I'm going to jump into a cream pie. And uh, because, because they had no sense of humor about themselves, um, some of the people on the new G4, that just completely opened it up to you are wrong. I am right. Go F yourself. And it was DOA and, and huge mistake. The old G4 would have had fun with it because yeah, that's also yep. a good way to, to kind of deflect. And it's like, you know what? You know what? Me, maybe be less of an asshole on the internet. By the way, here's my here's me in a bikini. Like whatever. Like sh sh it's ridiculous. Yeah, so, like the, yeah. you're never gonna you're never gonna do well if you're screeching directly into the camera because the right. whoever's watching that is gonna think it's directed specifically at them. Yeah, and just banging on was. about sexism and gaming and how dare oh you? God. And like I'm not you're, as bangable as Olivia Munn. Like yeah, no shit, you're not. Well, she's she's, <laughs> she's not wrong. She's not wrong. She's not wrong. About yeah, that. but it's I was like, say it's the 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 manner of the delivery, like you say, that's yes. going to be the the deciding factor here. And if that's how you choose to do it, an angry rant directly at the camera, the audience is going to think it's directed at them, and of course they're going to react negatively to it. Yeah, Th this was one of the explanations I had in one of my videos recently. Um. I talk about rock steady with Suicide Squad, but you could also apply to G four. Really, anything that doesn't work. It's the it's the theory of the ship of Theseus, right? The idea that if you replace every piece of the ship, is it still the same ship in the end? If yeah. none of the mm. pieces are the same anymore, right? So yeah. the idea I said in the video was like with rock steady is that like the people that made Suicide Squad compared to the Batman Arkham games, it's it still tracks in the same ways. Like, are they still rock steady if everyone that's inside of rock steady is no longer working there? Are they just rock steady in name? It's the same thing with like g4 in a sense right is, is g4 tech tv still g4 if all the people that are working there they weren't you know in in the you know hypothetical sense they're not the same pieces of the ship is it just g4 in name which i would argue it is only a name and what really matters in the end is that it's not the ship that matters it's the crew that matters that mans the ship you know what i mean and in that sense that like with g4 rocksteady whatever none of these things, none of these things will work if the people that make these things special aren't there anymore that's why with rocksteady Sefton Hill and uh, I think his name is Thomas Walker or something like that. They're the guys that actually founded Rocksteady and they left in 2022. And that's the reason why clearly, you know, Suicide Squad didn't do well. And you could put that towards anything. Like, think about it if from software, they're the guys that made Dark Souls, Elden Ring and all that stuff. Imagine if Miyazaki, who's the guy that, you know, created all of that, if he left the company, it wouldn't be from software anymore. Because he's the guy that comes up with the ideas, you know what I mean? It's sort of the same way, like, imagine Avatar one day when James Cameron's gone, or whatever. <laughs> Some equivalent to that. You know what I mean? I think Avatar it, I 17. Think, not the greatest example, but yeah. Yeah, I, not I, the great, I, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I think, it, I think it comes down to the priorities of your company and why do you exist. If, if you're making a video game, and I can come along and, like, bring a couple of Stellar Blade devs along and go, if you put this woman into your game, you will sell more copies. If you go, yeah, but I don't want to, then you're they're in the wrong business. If you're like, no, I don't want to because it'll offend my sensibilities and these people will get offended, then you are in the wrong business, you have the wrong priorities, and you shouldn't be in that position. The only thing that you should care about is making the best product for your customers. If that is not what you care about, you shouldn't be in the company in the customer service industry. Um, and that's what has been lost now. They have different priorities, and these 
from the top down of the company, they all have different priorities. Uh, I don't think until, essentially, you clear out enough of the company until you can say, this is what the customers want, and nobody complains. I, I don't see how you go back, which is my issue. Agreed. Let's do some super chats before we finish up. Worth mentioning anyway, because I saw a couple. No, of it's not. <laughs> uh, they, they were uh, proper credit where it's due. I think, uh, Endymion, you meant um, Paul Dini instead of Bruce Tim, right? For the Arkham games. Oh shit, you're right. Sorry, I'm a little nervous because there's like ten thousand people watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, it's, not, I mean, it's okay. It's, like, it's fine. That's the, how I much do. is it? I'm oh, actually Chat knows all. Oh, Chat will fuck correct me. Everything. Twelve thousand. Okay, now it's even worse for me. Thanks. No, it's good now because you 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 can say you meant that. That's what you meant. Yes, like, you just uh, misspoke. Yeah, yeah exactly. My bad. We, 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 yeah, we we you know we uh, give you a bit of slack on open bar because everyone starts drinking on this one, so <laughs> wrong things are said occasionally. Of course, um, I forget anyway, every single name in existence, so I'm yeah, never going to pick up in that. It's always at the most crucial goddamn moment as well. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway. Campbell Patterson says, I'm going through the Lord of the Rings trilogy for the first time, and holy shit, it's fucking amazing. I'm about to watch wow. Return of the King this weekend. P.S. Moore, I'm watching the extended editions. This guy's Good. watching it for the first time. How oh, jealous you, are we? I'm jealous, well, yes. And, and that's the thing. If someone said, like, should I start with the theatrical? I'd be like, they don't exist. They're gone. <laughs> Into the ether. Yeah. They never, they never happened, again. in fact. Let's just forget about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous that you're getting to experience this for the first time. Uh, Zeddy Boy says, hey, Drinker, thanks for letting my mom uh, film you telling me to do better for not making it to Megacon. Yeah, she said that you were extremely sweet. Thanks. <laughs> well, she was lying to you. I was a horrible person, but uh, glad you got the message, man. Thank you. Um, Big Hat Legion says, I got to hear Critical Drinker's favorite poet. Now let's hear Mahler's favorite. Oh, yeah, that was um, one of the questions for my Super Chat catch up. I named my Edgar, favorite Edgar Allan Poe as my favorite poet. So beat that, uh... Mahler. You have to remind me of poets I enjoy. I'm just not I'm not a regular poet enjoyer. Give me some names <laughs> and I'll see if any of them strike out to me. Over my head, no idea. <laughs> well, no, yes, I, I know a few limericks. She, she Miss Haney. Wordsworth. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Whichever ones was in oh what was oh, God, was it Knight's Tale? <laughs> there, there was some poets in that. Bukowski. Uh... There's got to be, there's people who enjoyed their poems, but I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't, there's no, poets don't come to mind for me of, like, favorite poet, I'm just, I'm I'm that uncultured, I'm sorry. Would it be a hot take if I class all rap as poetry, not, not music? Yeah. It'd be a hot take if you class rap as music, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I don't wow. think it's, I, I think just, it is closer to Robert poetry Burns. than music. Personally, I believe Robert Burns would be my selection. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh. AJ Film Guy says, any of you seen the anime Ghost Stories from 2000? The official English dub is the most over-the-top, offensive, and absolutely hilarious thing ever. Please watch it. Ghost stories. No, I haven't no. seen Ghost Stories, actually. Me either. Anime. I grew up on the 90s cartoons, man. I grew up on, like, Biker Mice from Mars, Street Sharks, Gargoyles, that kind of stuff. Fair news. Um, Northern English Bastard, you sound familiar, sir. It's almost like you've been on open bar before. Uh, Hail Drinker and Mower, with the tragic loss of Carl Weathers, which, yeah, sorry, mm. man. Uh, feel free to check out the very underrated Action Jackson. That is a fun movie, actually. It's very goofy, very 1980s, even though I think it was 1990 it came out. But, um, yeah, it was like his first potential to be a, a leading man, and it never quite took off, sadly. But I, I love Carl Weathers as an actor. And it's a shame he didn't get to do even more in his career than he already did. So, yeah. Shocking that he's passed away so suddenly. Um, Matt, R Matt PG says, I fully support Drinker Con. Come to the East Coast. All right, let's make it happen. Drinker Con. I like that idea. Uh, Type Zero says, should we take business advice from the man that tanked Twitter's value? Let's take Snyder's advice on the next su on the superhero movies. I mean, like, apparently user... Like the actual user base of Twitter has never been larger, from what I from what I understand. So the the problem is like advertising revenue on Twitter. Um, a lot of them have pulled their their ads, like companies like Disney. Um, I will say there's certain things that are quite annoying, like those the whole like 
um, gif of Peter Griffin running away and like, don't type Mia Khalifa into the search bar or whatever, and it's got like fifty thousand likes. Like, or all the porn ads. Crap. Yeah. But actually, it's gone I, viral. Have you seen this? And it's like some you know woman. I think the the further that X Elon gets away from advertising driven revenue model, the better. Because what you do is having been around media for a long time, I know you you if you if you are driven by ad revenue only, you owe something to the advertisers. If it's the users that are funding you, I mean, look, I happily pay the annual fee to have that little check. It's fine. You've got some advanced, you can edit tweets, it's good. Um, I think that user, you know, the users actually funding it, then you're beholden to the users, which is yeah, way, please. I think, way better model. And I, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, good. Disney's out on the platform, good. Go away. So, um, <laughs> love it's, it. It's a bad influence. Love it. Yeah. Um, he also says, uh, thoughts on the ungentlemanly, sorry, ungentlemanly warfare trailer. I'm reading the book and it's absolutely crazy. Love it. Uh, the trailer mm -hmm. looks a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm excited to see the movie. Hopefully it's good. It's, cool. it's got a lot of manly men in it. It certainly does. Yeah. There's, there's Finally. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of testosterone going on in that trailer. So I hope that's reflected in the movie. Um, Stardom says, hey, drinker, I learned about organized chaos today. Wish I didn't. What a loser. <laughs> Yeah, you're not wrong. Um, Gross out says this may sound like a meme, but to some, I really think you guys should get uh, drunk three P on sometime. He's genuinely a super nice guy and is close to Gina and part of GNG. He knows his stuff about Star Wars and comics. He's been on open bar before. What are you talking about, man? We've had we've had drunk three P on before. Well, yeah, I don't think we need to be convinced he's a nice person. And yeah, stuff. like yeah, we we know him relatively. <laughs> I, I had dinner with him at, uh, at MegaCon. It was nice. He was a charming chap. Um, yeah. Before I, I started again, making sure. videos, the first time I heard about him was via shout outs on Friday Night Tights every single week. So, he, like, he is living the meme. It was great when we did our panel at MegaCon as well. He fucking phoned Jeremy in the middle of it. And I we saw just, that. Like, that Jeremy awesome. just put his phone up to the microphone. It's like, fine, you just talk to everyone that way. <laughs> 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 it was great. Um, Mars Death says. Chris, Chris recommends the Flash. Hashtag we won't forget. Oh yeah. What Wait, are you talking Flash about? I said I like the parts with Michael Keaton. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. The internet never forgets, Chris. I just like to uh, bust my balls uh, about uh, certain opinions. Whatever you know. Um, uh, I mean, I also right. said I also said the biggest flaw of the movie is it's. Uh, You've got two flashes in it. It's two freaking uh I forget the actor's name. Ezra? Ezra, Ezra Miller. Miller. Two Ezra two. Millers was horrible. You know, yeah. and then like two King, too many. I have an affection <laughs> yes. for well, I mean, I, I, what are we highlighting here other than the fact that we like having all different kinds of opinions and I appreciate Chris being honest with us. I mean, you recommended American uh fuck American right American what's the new film that's coming out with uh Jeffrey Wright in it? Oh, oh. American, American fiction. fiction. That's yeah. the one, yeah. I watched it. I thought it was fucking great. Um, yeah. High oh, rate of everybody. That. You, you like recommended Triple R as well, which was yeah, RRR so. best movie of 2022, in my opinion. I Fantastic. still haven't seen it. And honestly, the last time I was on Open Bar, I kind of defended J.J. Abrams, and I walked away and I was like, "Why was I defending J.J. Abrams? <laughs> like, people like, will probably <laughs> I, come for me." Oh my, my god, they come to you too. <laughs> I, I I will defend certain parts of J.J. Abrams' history, yeah. just not his modern stuff. Yeah. Well, right. Sure. <laughs> Think, things Not like Alias, stuff, I will defend. Not his Star Wars movies. Yeah. Well, no, but you know, this was the beforehand. This was when he was up and coming. And look, I, I get it, the whole mystery box comments. Yeah. But there, there was a time where it was, it wasn't overused, and so you weren't as used to it. And so at the time, I think it worked. It's just now, yeah, you'd be better. Yeah. Well, to be fair, when was the last time you watched Alias? Oh, it was a long time ago. I was in college oh. <laughs> when I first watched it. I've watched it. I have watched it since, but even then, I'm an old git now, so it's probably well, you know, at least like eight years ago. said Disproof's probably too young to remember Lost. Alias is before what? Lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 36. <laughs> you <laughs> younger than me. Am I the youngest I mean, person I don't here? remember Lost. How old do you think I am? <laughs> and you know what? There was some good things in Lost too. 
I, yeah. I watched Little Alias Wars. because I watched Season it. One. It was on Channel 5, like, at midnight. And so I would stay up till midnight to watch it live before I went to college. And then at some point, it wasn't on over here. But a guy had, like, Sky or something. So he would tape it on VHS and give me the, the videotape the next day so I could watch there Alias at college. Hmm. What a true friend. Yeah. Yeah. Matt PG says, I love watching these live. Got you guys on the big screen out in the garage. Nice. Check you out with a TV in your garage, you absolute chad, you. Uh, love the panel here tonight. Cheers from central Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, man. Um, Chandler Galambos gave us $5. Cheers. Uh, Mike Morgan says, uh, does Chris know... Um, sorry, does Chris how still watch Leo Laporte? No. But I know who you're talking about. Leo Laporte was on the screensavers before I, I was on three. Show. I was on oh. three episodes of the screensavers. Anyways, I don't watch Leo Laporte currently. If he's on YouTube, that'd be kind of cool. I'll look him up for sure. Oh man, this is unlocking memories for me. Yeah, yeah. there's shows like Cheat and oh. everything on there. I used to watch so much stuff, dude. Oh my god. Oh my god. Um, Nicholas Steuer, this is, I think, a reference to like the, the night in Orlando saying, nothing wrong with slipping in some water from time to time. A wise man once said, you've got to detox before you retox. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, that was my says, London trip. I, I had water in one hand, whiskey in the other at all times. <laughs> yeah, worked out well. Uh, Snacks says, EFAP movies idea, the Forbidden Kingdom with Jackie Chan and Jet Li about an American teen who finds a magical staff that transports him to a mystical kung fu world. If you haven't seen it, then enjoy. There you go. Yeah, that sounds, suggestion. Yeah, it's a good session, yeah. We might do it at some point. Uh, Big Hat Legion has just joined as a member to the Fellowship of the Drink. Welcome aboard, <laughs> sir. Uh, King Job the God says, shout out to the panel, Drinker and Mauler. I always look forward to the, in, uh, sorry, an Endymion video on my way back from work and always look forward to Thursdays for Open Bar. Thank very, you. very much. Cheers, man. Uh, Neat Hoger says, Drinker and Longman, I'm once again going to ask you to watch Black Sails. It's basically an R-rated prequel to Treasure Island with pretty good writing and acting. I think you both would like it. Way is that the one with the guy from Coupling in it? That is awesome. If it is, I've, um, I've heard a lot of good, good things. things about Black Sails. Yeah, yeah. Th um, there was. Oh no, that is the different one. Black Sails is good, but there is another one which had Jeff from Coupling in it. They came out at the same time, went head to head, and one lost. And Black Sails continued. And a lot of people prefer Black Sails, but I prefer the other one. Black Sails is good though. Hmm. Drinker Mahler, do you two just have this massive long list of <laughs> things oh, you yeah, have to yeah. watch? We've talked about that many times. Like well, I wrote down every time someone emailed me or put a thing in chat saying, like, you know, I recommend this thing or whatever, I'd write it down in an actual physical book. And it's now up to about seven pages now. Whoa. Uh, of just like Damn. everything, like everyone is filled with recommendations. See, uh, so he's smarter than me. I do it by whatever I whenever I got a gap, I'm like, what have people been recommending? And then I search my head and I'm like, oh, it was that. And so it's basically based on enough loudness and frequency of people recommending things that's what they'll remember like that's what i watched silo recently high recommendation that was a lot of fun crossbones it stays good though crossbones is the pirate show i was thinking of it's got oh, a, a new one isn't on, ID on imdb but i really like it <laughs> well it was in 2014 um, oh right sorry what I think it had like john malkovich and richard coyle who was jeff from coupling in it uh i prefer it to black sales but unfortunately it lost the head-to-head -head. Um, question for the panel. Uh, this is from Cold Brew. What movie or TV trope are you sick of? For, personally, I roll my eyes whenever there's a rainy funeral scene. Why does every <laughs> everyone need to rain at every funeral scene? Yeah, good point. Because can like, I say Harley Quinn? World is crying. I'm just, I'm, you just say of, I'm just tired of Harley Quinn in general. Oh like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So overused now. I need her to stop. She needs to sit down in a cage. I'm equally tired <laughs> of Pedro Pascal being in everything. <laughs> yeah, that one too. I'm um, sick there of, was, I'm sick there of just, was like, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, you go first. Oh, okay. thanks. Um, I'm sick of just that trope of a man doing something and then failing, and then the women just going, oh, brother, oh, typical man. <laughs> That's all of modern entertainment. I guess for, yeah, for, for me, it's just like very, very uh, convenient stuff. And there's a scene in Reacher season two where the main bad guy, he's this terrorist guy and he's driving down the road and he needs a new, he needs a new uh, persona. And then he kind of like looks to the right and he sees like a doctor being, who has like an advertisement on the road that looks exactly like him. 
just like really you like very plot convenient stuff like that i don't yeah just it's just la- i guess lazy writing is what i hate the most which mm. is a lot of things then oh yeah mine mine kind of ties into that but it, it's where the, the someone tries to do something they have an obstacle they have to overcome and they can't do it but then someone in their ear or on the phone like a, a mentor or something goes no just believe in yourself you can do it i believe in you just do this you can do it and they're like oh my god i've suddenly leveled up but i can do it now i hate that 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 was that every sounds like CW every single episode yeah yeah it's every episode of the flash run barry yes, run yes. Every why, single why don't you just episode. wave your arms in a circle faster yeah. than last week multiverse oh. of madness when he, he says i yeah. came here to tell you to believe oh, in yourself Gosh. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a tiny little minor thing but it fucking happens every time right every time a character is on a highway and a truck drive past you always get the same honking horn sound effect where it goes like and then yeah. off into the distance every single fucking time like truck drivers are just constantly leaning on their horns like honking them constantly it pisses me off. I know it's just like a thing that they do in ADR, but I'm so sick of it. Sound effects is really interesting because if you play games, you start to recognize the same libraries of sounds that do everything. And there's two yeah. that I always recognize in movies. One is the the sound of Max Payne 1, the door opening. It's like... that. Whenever I hear that, I recognize it. The other is from Black and White, the game. And it is the kids giggling, and it's used in every single horror film ever. If you're supposed to yeah. be scared now, we just have children giggling in the background. It's oh, all the time. Yeah, horror mm-hmm. movies with a creepy little girl with dark hair. It's Always dark yeah. hair. Generic. Yeah. What um, do you guys actually consider to be the scariest movie of all time? Like, like, like genuinely, like disturbing, scary. Hmm. I think scary movies. It, it depends on when you watch them. Like. Um, what was the one that was in the forest and it had barely any budget? When I was a kid, that one really scared oh, me. Blair Witch Project. It now, it yeah. yeah, at the time I watched it, that really got to me. Now I don't think it would. Mm. Um, Same here, but it, for me, it was Paranormal Activity. Um, I couldn't walk. There was something, you know. It's again, it's low budget and just so well done, where it's entirely up to your imagination and. I couldn't walk down like empty hallways in my parents' home for a little bit because I'd watched it when I was in high school. I just, I would just keep looking down that hallway and it would just really get me. I, I agree. It, it definitely comes down to like when you watched it and the impact yeah. it has on you. Cause like, yeah. I watched The Omen when I was really young and that freaked the shit out of me. Um, just, yeah, the, 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 the soundtrack, the, the idea of like this fucking like demonic child like yeah all of that just yeah i have like i I have like three when i was a kid i remember watching return to oz and there were these guys in it called (laughs) damn it that was gonna be my choice yeah the (laughs) guys wheelers wheels for hands shit out of me as a kid dude when they're wheeling around following her around like that scared the crap out of me but uh the heads in the hallway that shit oh my god when the the queen takes the heads off and puts the new heads on yeah, that freaked me uh, out. There was another movie. Kid, yeah. <laughs> I th- I can't remember. I never finished it because I was a kid. It scared the crap out of me. I think it's called The Changeling. I don't. I vaguely remember it. They're, like the, the plot's like they're in a house. There's a kid that gets drowned in like a bathtub, and then the kid's like spirit comes back and locks the guy in the house and haunts him. I think it's called The Changeling. That movie scared the <laughs> shit out of me as a kid. I never finished it. If I quickly gave mine, it would be Blair Witch Project when I was a kid. I really enjoy Quarantine, the American version. Yeah, although, that's good shit. Yeah, that one really got to me. But if I had to they're locked overall, in like an apartment block, is it? Yeah, yeah, they're trapped yeah, yeah. in and you don't know what's happening. I, and I, the last scene when she's crawling towards the camera and get dragged away, that always stays with me. But yeah. if I had to give my scariest overall, it would be the woman in black in a theater. Because that managed to scare me and like have an imp- I-, I was like, I'm the Daniel Radcliffe. The theater. That's the, yeah, Daniel Radcliffe, right? Yeah, no, that was. Yeah, but it's, it's actually the theatrical jump scares in that one. The mm. theatrical performance is done by um, one bloke, and it's just a one-man show, and they have an actor to with a mask. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. I, it, it, it's I've in a theater. That. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it's like it's in the theater. I'm not gonna be scared. There's loads of people around me, and I'm like, no, that actually impacted me when I watched it. Uh, and there was jump scares. There was people coming out the crowd through the background and stuff. Uh, it's the best theatrical thing I've ever seen. Uh, definitely Ooh. would have scared me more, more than any. Another movie. scene that's really scary. It's in a Japanese movie called, I think it's called Pulse or Cairo. Pulse. I think it's called Pulse. That's Cairo's made in Japanese. Contact. Yeah, there's there's, there's, there's right a scene now. in that movie. I and mean, there's a guy that did a video on it called Spikama Movies. I think it's called. I remember watching that. And there was this there's this, there's this like clip where there's like a woman. She's like a ghost and she's walking down a hallway. 
and then she just starts like running on all fours but like the way she does it oh dude i i recommend it if you want to scare the shit out of yourself i guess like watch that scene i i think and just just the way she gets down and then she like crawls over like the couch and like mm-hmm. then you hear him scream outside the, the apartment great Really I, I think there's there's something really effective. Uh, I'm sorry to diverge into a, like a whole discussion about horror, <laughs> but there's something really effective about the normal turned abnormal. And so if you take mm. say an, a person who starts out walking normally, but then their movements become really unnatural, a way a, a, a normal human would never move or, or walk. Um, there's something it's just frightening. really disturbing about that. Yeah, because your brain's telling you there's something deeply wrong about this person. It's and the it same need with. To- dolls you know the the usage of dolls because you associate that with such a sort of naivety of of childhood and then it's but it's demonic in some way it's just such a frightening prospect it, it's why they always use little girls what it there, there is something innately creepy about that that's why it's used across all horror films i always remember the first resident evil film where she's like you're all going to die down here i don't think that would have impact had the same kind of impact if it was said by like a bloke with a deep voice yeah but the fact hey. that it was said by little child it, like it had it made it creepier you're all have going you to the- die down here <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the trailer for uh, like Hagrid pops up and tells you that have you seen the trailer for Abigail, the uh, little girl who's a ballerina who happens to also be a vampire? No, no, no I didn't watch that. Pretty, it looks it looks decent. It it looks decent. It's, Did uh, any of you guys it. see Lights Out, David F. Sandberg movie that he developed from a short film he made? I saw know. I saw the short film version, which I think is actually pretty scary. Yeah, it's the good. um the movie itself I wouldn't recommend, but there's like individual scenes that he made that are fucking real creepy. It's a creature that you can only see when the lights are off. And what I mean by that is mm. that you can kind of make her out in the darkness, but you can't make her out at all if the lights are fully oh, on. Oh, that's right. And I think she's, she stops existing when the lights are on as well. It's, it's very difficult to understand mechanically, but you know, there's a scene where a, a girl is waking up in her bed and she can hear scratching and she can just make out someone is scratching on the wall like a shadow. And then the lights are turning on outside through like a neon timer that's on some kind of like restaurant or whatever. So keep seeing her, then not seeing her, seeing her, I, not oh seeing God. her. She's as she's you know scrolling Getting on the closer. wall, and there's a payoff where like she's she's looking right at her and she's doing it, and then the creature turns her neck really quickly and looks directly at the person who's on it, oh. and then the lights turn on. So she's just like God again. <laughs> and this, it's, it's that it's what Baggins was talking about. Imagination is so much of a power when it comes to horror because yes. you're just like, yes. fuck. What did that mean? Where did that come yeah. from? Oh God. The you last five seconds games. of that of, of that of that uh, lights out thing is scary. You, oh. you see that with games. There are some people that can go through a horror game. They're not scared at all. But it, it's because their imagination only sees what's in front of them. Whereas the real horror in games comes from what do you think is about to happen, which is generally worse than whatever is about to happen. So you're always making up the next level yourself, and they just put you in the situation to make your imagination run wild. Yeah. And I think the the best fears come from like instinct. So. It is like, what, why are you afraid of the dark? It is because if you're out in a forest, the dark could hold anything. could have any predator, any- could be there. And so the sensible person is afraid and on guard by what else could be coming for you. Um, and so the, the best movies do play on what already exists, exists in the human psyche. I want to talk about a scene from Paranormal Activity 3, because in that, they go back to uh, 1980s. And paranormal activity is all just, you know, based on surveillance of the house. Is So you're s- sort of seeing, you're getting to see a lot more than the characters in the movie are getting to see. And so because it's in the 1980s, the man who's, who's suspecting that there's something going on in the house, he sets up uh, this oscillating, on an oscillating fan, he sets up a video camera. And so as it's oscillating and there's, there's a baby there's a babysitter who has put the kids to bed. And so she's in the kitchen and you get a camera shot of this kid-like figure covered in a white sheet sneaking up behind her. And you think, oh, that's normal because they were just playing this game where they were covering themselves in sheets and just you know, a couple minutes ago. And then it, it transitions away and it's inching closer and closer where you don't get to see that shot. And again, the oscillation comes back to frame where you see her in frame and then the sheet just drops. And you realize it's not a kid playing around. But then again, the camera transitions away. And so you're just caught in this moment of what's happening that I can't see. And then it comes back to her. And she didn't notice that there was a figure behind her because she was doing the dishes. So she just turns around and sees that there's a there's just a sheet 
um, on the ground. So she doesn't think anything of it. And that whole dynamic is just so beautifully done. I, I think that movie just really had me on the edge because again, it was, it involved kids and it really young kids who are the only ones who, I think the youngest is the only one who was able to see the, the demon supposedly. Would that really, if, I, if I think back, mm. think back to the woman in black in the theater, there were two moments that have stayed with me literally for decades. It's been like 20 years since I've seen it at this point. And the two much that I always remember is like there's a cart and the noise is getting larger and larger, larger and larger. And the guy's like right in the back, but in the background and without any kind of messaging, you just see the second person just walk past the background. Like they never mention it. It's just if you notice it, you notice it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, so, uh, and then there's another part where uh, they're just sitting in a rocking chair and as they're rocking, they just stand up and walk out. But they do it so unnaturally. It's so <laughs> bizarre, the movement, that it's creepy. And it, it's mm. not necessarily a lot of things rely on like the jump scare it's like i want the adrenaline push it's not that it is the creepiness is this is abnormal and this is weird and i should be suspicious of this thing that really leaves like the lasting impact on you there was a there was a, a scene i would remember in a movie called house on haunted hill right which was kind of just a goofy horror for the most part but they did a really cool effect at one point where someone's watching uh one of the ghosts um through a surveillance camera and it was achieved by having the actor walk backwards and then playing the footage backwards so that he's going forwards. And it, you get this really unnatural um, gait of mm. him. And it's just such a cool effect. Um, but again, it just plays into that feeling of there's something very, very wrong about what I'm seeing. But it's just the uncanny a person valley. walking. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's what the scene in Cairo is. It's uncanny valley. That's why it's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Another also, scene for me that's more recent is... Uh, it was in Hereditary, really quick one, when she's looking down the hallway and she sees her, her uh, dead mom standing there, kind of like she's in the darkness. And then she like turns the light on and the mom's gone. For some reason, that like three second scene just unnerved the living crap out of me. I don't know why. Dude, that's like oh. film with that shot where the person's waking up and the mum is in the corner of the room. Of oh, the yeah. Ceiling, you know? That shit. When I, when I was first watching that film, it took me a little bit. I finally noticed it and I had a jump scare from it. I was looking around <laughs> the screen like, whoa, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. My, my favorite thing about the Uncanny Valley is where they, it's like, um, when you realize the Uncanny Valley exists, you also have to realize that at some point in history, something happened, something occurred where you had to be so scared of something that looked just like you, but wasn't yeah. you, that you need to be scared of it. <laughs> that that's the real fear it's like what was that thing <laughs> that is yeah that's a good point actually well, what yeah what freaked our ancestors what made somewhere? you have the uncanny valley effect is the real fear to the point where like we're still like you know a hundred yeah, generations instinct. past like it's still afraid of it. that means it had a breeding yeah. advantage the fact that it's lasted this long Ex yeah. uh you will have to excuse me because i'm gonna sound like such a stupid no know it all here annoying know it all but it's not as sinister as you might think because if you look at gorillas where you can't see the whites of their eyes, right? Um, you can't tell where they're looking. And that's one thing that we sort of, one thing humans like is that they like to know what the other person's intention is. Like even the whole concept of a handshake is to know that you're not carrying a weapon, right? Is kind mm. of how it developed. And same with, we like to be able to read expressions. So there might have been versions of very early human beings that had faces that didn't really, weren't very expressive or that had, you know, we didn't have the whites of the eyes. And that slowly sort of that type of human being was more likely to survive because it didn't get killed by a competing tribe or however you want to think about it. Yeah. And this is the same reason, and same, same with expression. We like to know what people are thinking. We like to know if where they're looking while we're talking to them. Those like eye contact and facial expressions are really important in us gauging whether someone's a threat or not. And so I think that's where they sort of died out and we lost that. And But there's that uneasiness that still exists is that when we see someone where we can't tell what they're thinking, it makes us very uncomfortable. And that's why even this introduction of Botox is so strange that we're looking at faces that are only partially moving and we can pick up on it immediately that someone has had work done. We can just tell right off the bat that there's something there that doesn't quite feel right and where they're almost turning into cadavers, right? If you look at Madonna's face, it's, it's actually frightening looking. And I think it's for that reason is that you can't tell what they're thinking. 
That's yeah, why I have sunglasses for eyes, you see, so like I can make yeah. people uncomfortable because they don't know what I'm thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the scientific consensus is like whatever the missing link was or Neanderthals, they were, they look close enough to human, but you also didn't want to breed backwards. And so like... It's like Scottish like, people. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, you know, you stay over there. It's like, it's like, we're like do you're over vaguely this. humanoid, but we're, I wouldn't want to breed with you. we past you. We're more evolved. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me do a few more here before I finish up. Um, Filthy Casual says, It was nice meeting you and Nerdrotic. Uh, sorry I caught you outside the con center, but glad that I did. The booth was an absolute circus for the entire day. Uh, yes, it was indeed, but uh, you probably met us when we were trying to locate our passes because we totally lost them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was good to catch up with you, man. Um, Dr. Kaiju says, Howdy, drinker and friends. What's a movie that you liked at first, but now you can't stand? Cheers. Oh. I, I don't think there's any that I love, like that I liked, and now I hate. Like it doesn't swing that much. I don't think. Um, probably like Ghostbusters Afterlife. I kind of liked it at the time, and then um, the more I thought about it, the more I dislike it. I guess mine's kind of generic. It's gonna be TFA. I really liked it when I watched it for the first time. Didn't love it, but I liked it a lot. And I was like, this works. This works. This is a good idea. This is all. Yeah, this is a good trajectory. And then. Uh, I think it was ER's video that made me think about the film a lot more, and then I was like, "Holy fuck!" I actually kind of hate the film because it's it's almost the progenitor of the destruction of everything for Star Wars. I hated I the Force Awakens the first time I saw it, and I felt like something was wrong with me because I was in a room where everyone loved it. Everyone loved it, yeah. And it was, it was Han Solo's death that ruined it for me. That was the worst on-screen movie death of a legacy character ever in movie history. Colossal mistake. I, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And um, the more I looked into it for the TFA series, the more I found quotes of like JJ talking about how his intention was to make everyone feel as though they were watching the OT. It had nothing to do with the story of telling itself. Like it was a goal of, I want to put hmm. them in a position where they they get nostalgia blasted, basically. And that's exactly <laughs> what he did to me. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and and it worked for a lot of people, but I don't think it does anymore. Nobody ever references TFA as a good thing anymore. It's dead. You're right. I, I now thinking back when I was in the theater watching it, and then the energy of people walking yeah. out was just so they were so happy. It was felt like, you know, Star Wars is back. It felt like a good recovery from the prequels because at that time the prequels were really hated, and it felt like it was a recovery from that. But then things have really shifted, and now people look at the prequels a lot more kindly. Yeah. Oh yeah. For me, it's Avengers. That movie drags really, really, really badly once you what? watch it. You're the first wrong. Avengers movie for me. Interesting take. I'm yeah, shocked. for me, for me, it just it it drags from basically the beginning of the movie all the way up until when they go to New York and finally assemble. When you I first watched it, because actually I won tickets when I first saw it, so it was like you know hype and everything. And then once I watch it again and again and again, that movie just for me, I don't know. I just I don't I don't like that movie really up until they actually get to New York and assemble, and then you know. Everything happens after that. You didn't like really the, slow. the Cap, Thor, and Iron Man fight. I think I, the, I there's like scenes. There, there's I scenes. It, like, yeah. There's parts I like. Like I, I like that part. I like when they're all talking in the shield thing. He's like that man's playing Galaga and stuff. But a lot of parts of it, I'm kind of like, this is really slow. And yeah, not really my cup of tea. And one movie is it's gonna make a lot of people hate me probably, but one movie I love the more I watch it is the first Transformers movie because it's just so so schlock. I just I'll love that. I, 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 I like movie. the first Transformers. I, I liked so the first good. Transformers until it got so repetitive. I'm like, I've seen this before, but I still liked the originals because they were kind of new. Hmm. Um, with me, I don't think I've had something where I hate it more. I've had the, the other way around. Like Gone in 60 Seconds, didn't like it when I first watched it. The more I watched it, the more I like it. Paycheck, I hated that movie when I first watched it. The more I like, watch it, the more I like it. Um, there's things like Broken Arrow where... I, I like it, and the more I watch it, the more I like it. Like, it's probably, <laughs> it's Broken Arrow, is, isn't it? Broken Arrow is probably one of my favorite films of all time. It's like it, it, I can watch that film so many times. I've probably watched it more than anything else. So, but I don't think I've had anything where I, I hate it. The more times gone on, and I also love Hot Shots. The more I watch Hot Shots, I love that movie. Yeah, so it, we definitely come to appreciate these older films more this, as time. The passes scene when the when the then yep. the 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 director's like i've been working here for so many years and every time i stare out this window and that guy's always standing by the airplane he never moves and then they find yeah, out it's, it's a painting pain. <laughs> i i honestly think i i do probably like hot shots part do more than the first one even like i think the gags come thicker and faster and yeah it's it's a fun movie uh, but either way they're both good um 
D.W. Willard says, uh, or has just joined as a membership of the Fellowship of the Drink. So welcome aboard. Uh, John Gates says, I dwarf your JRPG norm normieism. The Final Fantasy VII Remake was the first game that I completed in the series, and I now have gotten the Platinum Trophy on Hell that. Yeah. 15, Stranger of Paradise, and 16, which was my game of the year last year. Mine too. Fair I love all those games. And I've platinumed all those games you just mentioned. But then I'm 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 a I'm a masochist when it comes to video games. I love hundred percenting them. So you're you're a completionist. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Winky Wanky Woo says, Hello, I'm Seth Rogan, and someone broke into my car and left a funny and witty script for a film. What the fuck do I do with this? Weed, haha, <laughs> bro. Yeah, that sounds about <laughs> right. Um John Gates says, also don't be afraid of streaming Final Fantasy VII. It can't be any worse than my 20 hours of drooling and making questionable noises when uh, Tifa does literally anything. <laughs> that is true. Dude, I am so were... excited for that game. It's unreal. I, I will not play the demo. I'm just, I can't. Because I know if I play it, I will just, it'll make the wait even worse. I'm just going to wait. They, they knew what they were I doing when wait. they designed her character model. I'll say that. Um, Super Cosmic Mutant Honey Candle Squid, which is a great name, says the studios are filled with Tumblr mutants who loudly stated that they'd implement a lot of DEI rules if they were in charge, and look at what's happening now. Yeah, they're in charge, I guess. Um, Chandler Gallimbos says, Drinker, you meticulous maven of middling media, it was great to finally meet you at Megacon. I finally started Dark Harvest, and I'm now hooked and excited for more. Thanks for the fantastic read. Awesome, thanks. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying it, and it was good to meet you too. Um, Matt PG says, I don't know if you know, but Genghis Khan was actually black. Well, of course, he was. Yeah, <laughs> I think every historical was. figure was. Yeah, and we female. are all black, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a state of mind. Um, Bobby Stevens says, Jedi, just enough dick inverted. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. That's good. Uh, man in the cos uh, camel hat says drinker are your books available in paperback yes they are all of them but also some of them are available in hardback so there you go Stephen d says deconstruction of modern storytelling has left no heroes anymore adding to ever depressing world we really need shows like garth uh Marengus dark place oh one of my favorite shows of all time that that is a show which is very niche because it's a spoof of like 1970s sci-fi, badly made sci-fi, but it is an incredible comedy and I recommend it to anybody. Nice one. Uh, someone's asking as well, what about bareback copies of the book? We haven't got to that point yet. That's the porno <laughs> version. Um, Flav says, in the UK, which is set to double its film capacity in the next decade, they currently offer this. Film tax relief is now available at 25% of qualifying film production expenditure regardless of budget. 25 percent that is pretty hefty is that why like marvel and amazon and stuff are moving all their productions over to the uk just guessing well yeah because it's quite easy for them to do because they can just discount that well that's 20 percent. so it, they don't actually have to discount that much but th this is one of the stupid things about hollywood filming things about hollywood um and i only know from things i've like heard but there's like um they, they were talking about a radius of things that you can film in hollywood otherwise you have to spend more and stuff i i think with stuff like california you get to a place where there are so many rules and regulations about what you can do with your workers and the industry there's so much red tape that you increase the cost massively and then you find out well, you actually don't need to do any of this in hollywood you can do it in the rest of the world it'd be way cheap way cheaper you get the same effects so why bother you're talking about all the grifts that have increased the costs of Hollywood movies like, um, you know, intimacy coordinator, COVID compliance officer, yes. DEI. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of new grifts. There's one that we just discovered called a sensitivity read, which is apparently mm -hmm. a service you can pay for. So, yeah, there's so much middle management bloat in Hollywood. Hollywood is incapable of making an inexpensive film anymore. And when you compare something like you know, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania to Godzilla Minus One. I mean, it's clear. So. I'm pretty sure they didn't have sensitivity readers on Godzilla Minus One. Yeah. yeah. Or Blazing what? Saddles or any Quentin Tarantino movie. I think that's a Thank terrible God. practice. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about sensitivity readers is you are hiring people to say what is offensive in your movie. So if they don't find anything, <laughs> that, right. what's the point of them, right? <laughs> So they right. are looking to be offended. If they don't find anything, they will make something up to be offended by, which means you will have to change it. 
it's so it, true. It, it is not you are yeah. asking for what the audience thinks. At, at no point is the audience involved in this. You're literally just hiring somebody to find something to correct. And we've seen this before. Uh, recently, there was um, they were changing the Bond books. And if you look at the changes, the original description was like the electricity of the room, the atmosphere, the, the language was better. Yeah. And then it was changed to something that was like soft and miserable and boring and dull. And it it it, it was literally the, the difference between somebody who re wrote something with 130 IQ and someone that wrote it with 80. Uh, it was the difference in well, language skills between did, them. Didn't he then bang on about how non-diverse the room was? And... Uh, probably. I, I can't remember the exact... I made a video about it, reading it out. But I, I remember because it touched on uh, subjects that were uncomfortable for the person involved. And so they had to change it and make it all nice. And it was like, oh. It, like, and the, the original text talked about the electricity and like the smell and the degeneracy of the room. But you can't talk about any of that now because people might get offended. So you lose the entire atmosphere of the situation and you destroy the reason for that scene existing in the first place. Exactly. Um, I'll do a couple more before finishing up. Kevin O'Neill, who's been a member for four months now, says, speaking of Asian cinema, Drinker, you really haven't seen Hero. You need to remedy this ASAP. That movie is incredible. Yeah, what can I say? I'm just a filthy casual. Um, I will watch it, though. Snex says, you've mentioned British comedy shows before. Have you ever seen uh, The Goes Wrong Show? Curious of your thoughts. Cheers. Uh, no. The Goes Wrong Show? No, I haven't seen that one. No, man. What about Red um, Dwarf? I, I yes. God, I'm trying also to convince Gary to watch Red Dwarf. I seen, Wait, Gary hasn't seen it? How has he not seen, seen Red Dwarf? Seen Red Dwarf. How can I he know, be a sci-fi geek and he's not seen Red Dwarf? That's I don't know he's seen that, yeah. I yeah. Used to you, know, you know what? He, on VHS. You know what came up on my catch-up stream as well? Brass Eye. I, I would, I'd love to get modern Americans' take on Brass Eye because that show is fucking incredible. You would never get it made now. No fucking way. Um, oh, it had Kevin Eldon in it. Yeah, he he has done some bangers in his time. Oh yeah. Uh, last yeah, what's the next one? Um, yeah, I'll do this one more. Uh, Cannon Faldrol says. From my point of view, the Jedi, J-E-D-I, are evil. Then you are based. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a great way to finish up. That's a great one. <laughs> uh, I will. I will finish up there because we have been going for about three hours now. Um, so it's been a it's been a fantastic stream. It's been lovely to get back into open bar again after being away for a week. Um, and thank you very much to my awesome panel of guests. You guys have been absolutely fantastic this evening. I appreciate all you, you guys giving up a few hours of your time to come on for this. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, uh, yeah, always a you. pleasure. Yeah. Always fun. And I appreciate the mods for doing the, the usual awesome job that you guys always do. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. And uh, thank you to chat for the... I think at one point we had 14,000 people joining us. So um, thank you, guys. And thank you for the 10,000 that have stuck around until the very end. Uh, you're thank awesome you as you always are. Nervous. Yeah. Halfway through the stream. Uh, thanks for making Endymion nervous as well. It's been good. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Just, you said you were oh, nervous by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because everybody on this freaking stream are like people that I watch. Like, like as soon as I went, went, went okay. I saw when I saw baggage claim come on, I was like, what the heck? I watched this for like so long. And then Chris Gore comes on. I'm like, come on. <laughs> and I, I mean, just forward to it. Just like, I, like, I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm like, I'm like a fan who's just, you have imposter like, syndrome. Yeah. yeah exactly. I'm just somehow like sitting here, like, I'm like, should I be here? I don't, but yeah, I'm just thankful to just be included. Just, it's crazy, dude. So thank God. you. Plus, we can arm wrestle women. So that's, hell uh, yeah, bro. Yeah. Yeah. That's what all that. that. In, in in wrestling. Wrestling. Uh, no, thank you guys we for coming on. We need some video of your arm wrestling badging, baggage claim. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> <You're more confident. laughs> I was just about to say, I do not volunteer as tribute, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd, uh, yeah, thank you for all the amazing super chats. Um, obviously, we haven't finished them all, but we will catch up with them as we always do on our last oh, order dogs. stream. Um, yeah. But... We will finish up there. And so for now, at least for all of us from Open Bar, thank you. And that's all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye.